stay muted when we're not speaking. That'd be wonderful. Thank you for your patience. We are now live. Everyone, welcome to the regular board meeting of the Cook County Commissioners. Today, May 25th, 2021 at 8.30. Call this meeting to order. Now, please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Mr. Chairman, just so you're aware, at the very beginning, your audio is kind of intermittent. Thank you, Mr. Yorkey. Um, yeah, my, my uh, little mic arm was, was going away. And okay. I'm sure that's adjusted. All right, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? See none, I hear none. So I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion, is there a second? Sullivan seconds. Sullivan. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, any further discussion? Not, but um, do a roll call vote here. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, we have our agenda. Um, item number two public comment period. This is an opportunity for citizens to appear before the county board and express sorry, any sorry. comments uh, they may have. And sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Yorkey. Sorry to interrupt. Do you want to read the statement about virtual meetings? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Number one, it has been determined that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the related peacetime emergency declaration made by Governor Walls in accordance with Minnesota Statutes Chapter 12. Number two, we have ensured that all members of the body participating in the meeting, wherever their physical location, can hear one another can hear all discussion and testimony offered at today's meeting. Number three, we have also ensured that members of the public present at the regular meeting location of the body can hear all discussion, testimony, and all votes of the members of the body. We have urged the public not to attend this meeting in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic. and have ensured that members of the public can view and monitor the meeting remotely in real time by broadcasting the meeting on the Cook County website. Number four, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have determined that it may be unfeasible for County Auditor Brady Powers, County o Attorney Molly Hicken, County Administrator James Yorkey, and members of the Board of Commissioners to be physically present at the County Boardroom at the Cook County Courthouse. Number five, all votes will be conducted by roll call, so each member's vote on each issue will be identified and recorded. Thank you, Mr. Yorkey, for that reminder. Uh, moving on to the public comment period. Um, opportunity for people to speak. Uh, we, we'll have a time limit of um, five minutes uh, for each each person uh, wanting to speak, and I'll have a timer going here on my end. Um, I can give you a one minute warning, um, maybe just as a as a visual. Hopefully, um, that won't interrupt anyone. I'll just raise my my hand up like this. Um, please address uh, the board, and please keep it respectful and. Um, who would like to start? Uh, please raise hands. Mr. Gash. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just get this done with. I, I have trouble with public speaking, so bear with me. Uh, hi, for the record, my name is Jason Gash. My family has lived at 852 County Road 14 for over 17 years now. I am here in opposition to the kennel request you'll hear later on but I'd like to start by thanking all of the county personnel who have devoted their time to this issue. I, I truly appreciate it. Um, we're obviously a little nervous about this, but as per my written statements, there is abundant information I feel from land services that this kennel 
has many issues with its design and physical features, I would like to remind everyone attending of some of their descriptions of the seven acre lot being proposed today. One, and these are all quotes from the, the land services summary, the selected kennel yard is mostly within a wetland resource. Two, shifting the yard outside of these wetland features will likely conflict with the required 100 foot property line setbacks, which is already challenged given the 250 foot property width. And three, final quote, appears to push the spatial envelope. Additionally, I have provided both the Planning Commission and County Board with data on sled dog noise that shows at least, well, it shows at the 100 foot setback, 20 dogs generate on average between 60 and 75 decibels of noise. And the MPCA 7030 standard for nighttime is 55 decibels. You can see the obvious problem. In spite of these findings, an interim use permit is being recommended to this board. I think this, despite the best of intentions, would be a big mistake. It essentially suggests an experiment with live animals when we already know the outcome. Several planning commission members did voice their concerns about this idea. In closing, I'd like to add that according to section 10.05 of the conditional use permit process, the applicant bears the burden of demonstrating a right to a permit. Two key parts of this are proving that this use is compatible with the existing neighborhood and that the location and character of the proposed use is considered to be consistent with a desirable pattern of development for the area. To anyone that was able to visit our neighborhood, it should be obvious there are no sled dogs in our immediate neighborhood and development has been all residential over the past 17 years we've lived here. As one final reminder, this property feeds into the Cadence Protected Watershed through a chain of beaver ponds that the applicant plans to daily run dogs over in the winter to access public trails. In the bigger picture, there is no specific language in the land use guide plan that mentions County Road 14 as a dog area. Yet oddly, it states that this general area is, quote, particularly noted for its concentration of dog kennels and dog sledding enthusiasts and associated businesses. Again, there are two large acreage kennels and they are both at least a half mile from here. No business that I'm aware of. And this particular application is for recreational use. Again, to all who visited, it's clear that this is a residential neighborhood. Please, I beg you, keep this residential. Please reject this proposal on the basis of space, wetland, and sound issues, as well as the adverse effect this poses to adjacent properties. If for some reason you are required to pass this interim use, I would like the setback from our property to be extended to at least 150 feet. That was a condition of the failed Paul Prejean kennel back in 2008, the last time we had a request. Also, I would like to, uh, sorry, I have a cat rubbing its tail against my paper. <laughs> uh, I would like to see that any noise violations would immediately terminate the interim use permit. Thank you for your time and consideration. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gesh. Um, you had one minute left and um, put you all through. We'll pass the mic here. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't see either um, Ms. Swedman or Mr. Leingang. Um, and I also see um, Ms. Kimball, um, but I have no video. So um, if anyone would like to turn their video on and um, raise their hand, that would be great. Otherwise, I, I guess I'll just call on uh, Ms. Sweetman is, to go next. Is, I'm sorry, is my video not working? Well, no, I guess it is not. There, there's a, a black screen, but no image, and that's okay, but we can hear you okay. Okay. Um, so do, do, do you mind if I start? It would be wonderful. Yeah, please just say your full name and your address, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll start the timer after that. Hello, my name is Angela Swedman. I live at 821 County Road 14, just down the road from the lot in question. Um, I too am here sharing my thoughts and comments on the proposed dog kennel. That will be just down the road for me. Um, 
I attended the last the planning commission meeting on the 12th of May and um and this was one of the items that was discussed was the proposed kennel at the corner of County Road 14 and Frank's Way. Um, I know that a number of letters were submitted supporting Mr. Langing's proposal, and it appears that he has a lot of experience working with sled dog kennel, sled dogs in kennels that were owned by other people, both in Alaska and Minnesota. Um, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but his request isn't about friendliness. Like this is more about that this property is way too small for, for 25 dogs. Like I know that 25 is a, a change from what the original request was, which was either 40 or 45, but this is like respectfully, it's easy to make the decision when you don't live here. And I very much appreciate like all of the commissioners time that they've put into this, like um, hearing the neighbor's concerns, hearing what's happening here. But I just would like you to remember that like the, this is going to affect our neighborhood and this is going to affect water quality or it has the potential to affect water quality. Um, I disagree that if the county is already concerned, which my understanding is the county is concerned that setbacks won't be met for the CUP that was originally requested. So then it was changed to an IUP. Um, the fix to that isn't, isn't a compromise of an IUP. Like it's, it's the unfortunate truth that I, this is not gonna work. Um, I'm concerned that the likelihood of not meeting the property line and wet wetland protection step setbacks is great. Um, that the likelihood that dog noise will surpass the maximum level allowed by state law is great. And granting this permit will be made based more on the property owner's dream and the community's or the county's support of that dream that this will work out and not on the actual fact that Yes, though the immediate neighborhood has historically been a place where there were dog sled kennels, that is not how it is today. And I would encourage anyone with questions about this to look into like how much land were on those, were those historical kennels on? They were not on small lots. They weren't on just little, little lots with neighbors right next door. They're on larger pieces of land. I'm concerned that the proposal will not be able to successfully thrive without affecting, um, without affecting the landowner's neighbor's enjoyment of their respective properties. And more importantly, I'm concerned that of the effect that the addition of two dozen dogs will have on a beaver pond at the south end of the lot. The beaver pond that drains into the Cadence River tributary and eventually, of course, into the Cadence River itself um, I've spectated dog sled races. I'm familiar with their toileting habits and I fear that, I fear that even if Mr. Langang is diligent about keeping the dog waste composted while they are on their lot, during training, a significant amount of waste will be deposited into the frozen pond at the south of his property as a foreseeable result of training his team along that trail during colder weather when the beaver pond is frozen over. Um, so I guess I have questions about how the county would be planning on monitoring the health of that wetland. Would regular testing be done? Um, you know, I, some biological pollutants have lower safe level thresholds for babies, expected mothers, immune compromised and elderly folks. And I strongly urge the county to take a proactive stand to prevent the pollution of surface water in our neighborhood and community. I, uh, thank I think that's about everything. Me. Thank you very much. That's, that's good timing. Um, your time just, just ended here. Thank you very much for 
for your comments and your concerns. Um, if, if you could please mute, and we will we'll move on to our, our next um, commenter. And um, just as a reminder, this is this is the, the opportunity for the public to speak. Uh, we will not be um, speaking again as 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 we uh, move on to this issue into the agenda. So I don't know if Mr. Langang, if if you would like to um, speak at this point, um, or I'm presuming Ms. Kimball. Um, yeah, that sounds good. I can go if that. Absolutely, yes. And please, again, just full name and address, and, and I'll start the timer after that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm Jacob Langang. Um, my address is 5 Franks Way. Um, good morning, folks. I guess um, my hopes out of this today is that you um, at least consider taking off the interim use title that the planning committee um, recommended and changing it to a interim use title based on my lifetime of the property as opposed to two years. Um, my reason being is having your pets for two years seems like a very inhumane thing to do. Nobody else anywhere in the county is gonna come up and be like, you've had your pets for two years, you can't have them anymore, or you must apply for a permit to keep your pets after two, year, two years. Um, and they have not, the county has not done that before ever with a dog kennel. Um, regarding some of the other concerns that have been brought up, um, I know there have been some wetlands concerns and I, I get that there are wetlands on my property, but there are not wetlands where my dog yard is. And in the county ordinance, there are specific setbacks that I need to meet um, to keep away from those. Um, Mitch Travis and I walked my property again yesterday and we flagged a ton of stuff and he actually found a lot more space for a potential dog yard. Um, so the wetlands issue is kind of moot in my point, in my idea. Um, also, when all this happened in 08 during the Paul Prejean kennel, there was all kinds of wetland specialists out that did all sorts of testing on the kiddons and there was no trace of dog waste found anywhere. Um, all that stuff has to stay with the county at some point. So I know folks have that resource to be able to see. Um, the other issue people are bringing up is noise. Um, there has not been any history in Minnesota of dogs breaking the Minnesota noise ordinance, um, which Cook County adopts. We don't have a specific county ordinance. Um, and that's also proven back again in the 08 Prejean um, stuff. Bill Lane and Tim Nelson did extensive studies sitting at the end of people's dog kennels with the, the meters that read decibel levels and did not have any issue again, which is why that kennel permit was granted. Um, I would also like to show that in the county guide plan, Cook County promotes dog mushing frequently. Um, in the guide plan, it also states Frank Way, Cadence River Watershed as a dog mushing neighborhood where they specifically want dog mushers. I moved into this neighborhood because I have dog mushers as neighbors and because it's where the county promotes. We have trails coming right out of our backyard. It's the easiest place to have a dog kennel. And I ask if you don't want dog kennels there, where would you want them? It is, it is where the guy plan specifically states that you want it. Um, I'm not creating any new trails. All the trails that are on the ponds that I'll be using are already there and already used by multiple mushers. Um, also regarding the lot size, there are other kennels in the county on smaller lot sizes with larger number of dogs. It's not unprecedented. Um, again, in the ordinance, the county had every, every right to set a minimum lot size, but they didn't. All they did was set setbacks, setback distances, which I meet all of. My property is also 265 feet wide, not the 250 feet wide that was previously mentioned this morning. Um, I guess the last thing that I ask is that you all just vote by the ordinance because that is all that we can vote on. Um, and the ordinance, I, I, I follow everything. I check all the boxes. Um, and I guess the, back to the original point of going from the interim use of the two year to interim use of my life of the property. If I break anything in the ordinances, I lose the permit either way. So I don't understand why I would have to reapply in two years when if something goes wrong in year one or year 60, I lose my permit. So at that point, 
doing the two year interim use permit instead of the life permit, all you're choosing to do is be inhumane to dogs, which doesn't seem right to me. Um, so I guess, yeah, those are, those are my points. Thanks for taking my time to listen to me. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. And um, I, I'm not sure if um, Ms. Kimball, you, you would like to speak as well or, or Mr. K it just says L. Kimball, so I'm assuming it's yes, Lacey. But I would like to there. Speak. Yeah, and could you just please state um, your full name and then address, and then I'll start a five-minute timer after that, and um, and I'll give a hand signal as long as you can see me. That that should work for when you have one minute left. Lacey Kimball at eight twenty-one County Road fourteen. Can you hear me? Yes, but it's a little uh, difficult. So if you could, I don't know if speak up is possible, um, that might help. Okay. Um, Lacey Kimball at 821 County Road 14. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am here in opposition of the kennel as has already been stated by other participants, it is a very small area. It is a lot of dogs. This, historically, this area of County Road 14 did have multiple kennels. It no longer has multiple kennels. Life and history moves on. And this particular area has in the last decade been moving beyond the dog mushing. I, I understand historics. I also understand this is not the 1990s. This is the 2020s. I do not agree with removing the interim use at all because as was mentioned in the previous meeting, Two years is a long time for bad neighbors. And it's one thing to say that your dogs are not going to cause noise, but that doesn't mean that in actual, that is what is going to happen. There, there are plenty of other kennel areas in the county and most of those areas encompass larger acreages with fewer neighbors, with fewer residential non-kennel neighbors. And I wanna thank everyone who came out to the area and looked at the different, walked down the road, looked at the properties. Thank you for taking your time to actually come and check on this area. That, that's about all I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. And um, if you could just mute again, um, as long as you're, you're through with your, with your comment, I appreciate that. And um, thank you everyone who, who did have comment. Is there, is there anyone else um, that's uh, in our meeting here who would like to give public comment at this time? If so, um, either unmute and speak up or, or turn your camera on and, and give a visual. Um, I don't see anyone and I'm not hearing anyone. Um, Mr. Yorkie, were there any additional uh, written public comments that you received? Mr. Chairman, I did not receive any comments to be read uh, during the meeting today, but I do want to point out uh, this will probably be a good time since we do have some folks commenting this morning that the, the other way that you can offer public comment is to send written comments to my office and I'll make sure those get read during the meeting if you'd prefer not to speak yourself. Thank you, Mr. Yorkie. That's, that's a very good point. Um, one other thing I, I would also like to mention is just that um, to keep good process here, it's, it's very important. And I believe everyone who has, has spoken, uh, maybe not everyone, but what, 
dur during the uh, planning commission's meeting and the, the hearing on these issues is maybe one of the best times to speak to the particular issues, and um, then the planning com commission can use those uh, comments in their deliberations as well. And I think maybe that had already been done with with the participants at today's meeting, but I just wanted to point that out for the public at large and for us as commissioners to know more about about process there. So. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone, again for for your comments and your concerns, and and um, appreciate the appreciate the input. And um, I think at this point I can close the public comments safely. Uh, I don't think we've missed anyone, and uh, that will move us on to uh, item number three, which is the consent agenda. Um, would any commissioner like to pull any item from the consent agenda for further discussion? Doesn't look like it. In which case, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. Commissioner Swallowson moves to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Swallowson. We have a motion. Is there support? Starley support. Commissioner Starley, we have a motion and support. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Swallowson? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, we have approved the consent agenda unanimously. Thank you very much. That moves us on to item number four, COVID-19 update uh, with Grace. Good morning, Grace. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me back. Um, let's see, updates from the COVID response. Our case count is at 170. That is up eight cases since the last presentation I gave to the board two weeks ago. Um, one of the biggest updates, which I'm sure you've all heard about, is the changes with mask requirements. Um, and that happened just about a week and a half ago. The CDC did come out and say, if you are fully vaccinated, in other words, two weeks past your last dose of vaccine, you can safely choose not to wear a mask in most settings. Um, and if you are not yet fully vaccinated, that the recommendation is to continue wearing a mask in most settings. Um, and so after that announcement from the CDC, Governor Walls did um, drop the state mask mandate. And I would say on a local level in these past few weeks, I have gotten quite a few questions from both community members and local businesses wondering, you know, what, what's next? So our approach has really been to just provide them with that CDC recommendation, links to CDC um, resources. And then um, Andrea Orist in her role working with businesses is also available to help troubleshoot options. Um, some of the other recommendations are for businesses to put really clear signage up stating their expectations to avoid confusion for customers. Um, as well as continuing to offer options like curbside pickup or remote service delivery for members of the community who are um, immune compromised or not able to receive the vaccine or otherwise feeling uncomfortable um, going into public spaces with the change in mask use. So there's a lot to, um, to communicate there, but we're happy to help if people have questions. I think the exciting thing about this announcement is it does come with a pretty broad body of, of evidence that now shows how well that the vaccines work at preventing infection. So the CDC's recommendation is grounded in that uh, emerging body of evidence. And it's, it's good to know that we have such a powerful tool in, in stopping the pandemic. Um, in terms of vaccination, at this point, we have 69.4% of Cook County residents who have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 65.6% .6 are considered fully vaccinated. So we do continue to 
um, see that number climb. It's the pace is a little bit slower, but we're still definitely making progress. And we still are offering vaccination regularly, both first dose and second dose opportunities. So the past two weeks, we've had some really successful events. We've had um, evening and weekend clinics at the community center. We also did a, a clinic at the Lutzen Town Hall. Um, we're planning to do another event at the Lutzen Town Hall. Um, we're also going to be in Schroeder at the Schroeder Town Hall tomorrow in the late afternoon, early evening. We still have plenty of spaces available at that clinic if anyone um, in Schroeder is, is interested in receiving a vaccine. We also are going to be going up the Gunflint next week for um, mid-trail and end-of-trail events. And next week, in partnership with North Shore Health, we'll begin to offer Pfizer clinics that are open to individuals age 12 and older. So um, that is the, the Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine that has been granted emergency use authorization for the 12 and up age group. And um, locally, the one entity that's receiving and administering Pfizer is North Shore Health. So the clinics are really a partnership between um, North Shore Health and the, and the county. We're assisting with registration and outreach and volunteer support for the event itself. And then the nurses at North Shore Health are actually administering vaccine. So we're planning to offer one clinic on the third, which is full, um, that's 48 doses. We have another on the 10th set that is nearly full. So that's also a 48 dose clinic. And we're exploring the option of, of adding another date on the 17th to make sure that there continues to be access for, for teens as well as other members of the community. We are targeting that 12 to um, 17 age group since it's the only vaccine available um, of the three to those that teen group, but it is open to everyone else as well. So everyone over the age 18 and up is welcome to attend the Pfizer events. We're also looking at what will happen um, with clinics longer term and talking with Sawtooth Mountain Clinic about transitioning midsummer our vaccination events to be events that actually happen in the lower level of the clinic. So we're working out the details of, of that, but um, we can expect to put out a media release with some more specifics in the, in the coming days and week here. So, um, in terms of communications and outreach, we have been continuing to try to spread um, evidence-based information on the vaccines through a Q&A section in the News Herald, which also goes to Boreal. Um, we have a rotation of authors from both Sawtooth Mountain Clinic and Public Health who have written every week on a different frequently asked question about the vaccines. So. Last week, Hannah Miller, who is our, our WIC clinic coordinator and our family home visiting nurse, wrote an installment on pregnancy and breastfeeding and the vaccine. And then this week's topic will be on teens and the vaccine. We're also offering a parent education opportunity on June 1st for parents to um, attend a short presentation with myself and Dr. Farshman, who's the COVID medical response director for Satis Mountain Clinic, where we talk a little bit about the vaccines, about what we know about the vaccines and their use in the teen population. And then there'll be quite a bit of opportunity for parents to ask questions as well. Um, and that, that presentation, we do plan to record it. So if someone isn't able to make it, um, they'll be able to watch that after the fact. Um, and it'll be on the county's YouTube page. We also are continuing to work on our, our Voices of um, Public Health and Vaccination campaign. Our, we're going to be debuting that series this week. Um, Nick Cusick, the public information coordinator, has been working really hard on developing that content. So our first installment this week will be with Sheriff Eliason, who is kind enough to let us um, interview him and take some photos and video of um, his experience during COVID and following public health um, recommendations. So that will be something that is present in the News Herald. It will also be something that we are releasing via social media on the county's Facebook page. So that's what's new in, in the public health response. Happy to take any questions from the commissioners.
Thank you, Grace. Uh, do we have any any questions for Grace this morning? <clears throat> Chairman Mills. Yeah, Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Um, good morning, Grace. Uh, congratulations on your Viking Award. Thank you. It was quite a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and especially to a Norwegian girl, too. Yeah, I don't know. They must have just looked at me and guessed. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, guess, I don't have a question, just a comment, Grace. You know, the implications of non-vaccinated people ripples out into the community. And, you know, it keeps when you have to do then... Uh, finding out who the contacts are. It closes businesses, keeps people at home. It's, um, it's really in our little community can be, um, you know, devastating for businesses to have to close down. So, you know, I just, um, I hope that with all your clinics coming up that more and more people, teenagers will take advantage of the vaccines. Because as you say now, the case number is up to 170. It had been 168. So um, just, you know, keep on the good work and keep the promotion going to be safe for yourself and for other people. That's the important um, comment, I think, if they would just think about that. Yeah, it's definitely an important part of the message, just the effects um, that, it, that vaccination is something that can help our local business community because of fewer people out in isolation and quarantine, but um, we'll just keep at it. We're always happy to take questions from people and um, we try not to be too pushy. We just try to answer people's questions and make sure they have access to opportunities. But you're absolutely right that there's a benefit to our local businesses when fewer people are in isolation and quarantine and vaccination is a powerful tool to, to help us get there. Mr. Starley, and thank you, Grace. Um... Mr. Yorkie. There we go. Um, so I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, commissioners. I just wanted to note that uh, Cook County is still number one in the state out of all counties for vaccination rates. Our vaccination rates for people 16 and older is at 80%. Um, our vaccination rate for the total population, and I should say that's, that's people who've gotten at least one, one shot. Um, for, for total population, um, the number is 69% have gotten at least one shot. And it wasn't so long ago um, that we were talking about getting this effort started. And here we are some months later and have such high rates. And I just, I bring it up because I just want to recognize the great work of Grace, um, all the folks from Sawtooth Mountain Clinic and North Shore Health, all of our volunteers who made these successful vaccination clinics possible. Um, this is one of the things that drew me to Cook County is the high level of collaboration that goes on when there's a problem to solve, people here work together to solve it. And I just think it reflects well on, on the county, on uh, all the folks who live here, and on our organizations that can work together successfully to solve really big problems. Um, so thank you, Grace, and thank you to, to all of our community uh, volunteers and folks from the clinic and hospital. Who, who made this success possible. It's great to be part of this. Mr. Yorkie, yeah, and I'd like to also um, point out um, just Grand Portage Clinic, how, how crucial their, their role was in, in this effort and um, just really thankful for their partnership and, and all the efforts being done there too. Thanks, Commissioner. Any, any other? You remind me of something I forgot in my update. So we have been working with Grand Portage Health Services and doing in-school education with our middle school and high school science classes about how viruses spread, how vaccines work, um, the connection to COVID-19, and then giving, giving our students a chance to ask questions as well. And it's another example of um, the partnerships and working with Grand Portage Health Services has been fantastic. They're key partners and they've just um, brought so much to, to the collaboration. And um, most recently it, teaching with some of um, the nurses from Grand Portage Health Services has been really a fantastic experience as well as partnering with our schools. Yeah, I was gonna ask how, uh... I'm, you know, kids have very inquisitive minds. How, how, how has it been received, uh, the information? Lots of really good questions, I imagine. 
I mean, every class is a little bit different, but um, yeah, we have a lot of kids with really good questions and it's been fun to engage with those questions and kind of see what, what people have to say and what kinds of questions they have to share. I would say they're just kind of all over the map. There's not like a most commonly asked questions, some myth busting based on, um, you know, what's going around on the internet, but yeah, overall, just really impressive young people in the, in the middle school and high school. Thank you. Any, any other uh, questions or comments for Grace this morning? Um, I would just echo the thanks and, and, and the praise and the congratulations on, on the award and, um, and just our success in our community. It's, it's wonderful and I'm very excited to hear about those um, full and near full um, clinics for, for the 12 and up, that's going to push our numbers uh, even higher for, for vaccinations, right? That's that's very exciting. So thank you for, for working. Uh, and that's tricky too, just with, uh, I know logistically with, with the Pfizer vaccine. So thank you for your efforts there. Um, with with no other questions or comments, I'll, I'll bid you good day, Grace, and then thank you again. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. All right, that brings us um, on to item five, human resources. Um, uh, HR uh, Director Dixon, good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mills. Good morning, commissioners, colleagues, and community members who may be listening. I'm here this morning to request approval for a new job description that was written by Allison McIntyre and Grace Bouchard. After a resignation in the department, they reassessed uh, what their needs were and developed a new social worker position. Uh, the children's mental health case manager and therapeutic support services position. This did go through our personnel committee uh, as well as our job evaluation committee and it was classified uh, similarly to other social worker positions at a grade 170. So I am asking your permission today to approve this new job description so that we may uh, turn around and start recruiting. Pam, um, any, any questions or, or comments from commissioners? I don't see any or hear any, I'd entertain a motion. Commissioner Sullivan? like to move to approve the uh, position, the new social worker position. And again, I want to thank you very much, Pam, for your hard work and for Allison and Grace uh, putting this together. Commissioner Sullivan, we have a motion. Is there support? Starley support. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. We have a motion and support. Uh, any further discussion? see any or hear any, I would just add that I really appreciate um, the work that's involved, uh, just reevaluating, having to pivot. Um, it's kind of a, a continually changing scenario in our community, and and I'm just always so impressed with, with the department and with your work, Ms. Dixon, on um, being able to reevaluate what our community needs are and how we can best address them. So thank you for, for your work there. Mm -hmm. All right, um, no other questions or comments. I'll do a roll call vote. Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Smallson? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that moves us on to item number six in the highway department. Uh, we have our 2020 annual report, and I believe, uh, uh, oh, you guys turned your cameras on. Yeah, we have both Engineer Haas and Ms. Sarley here. Uh, good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen for everyone so that you may see the PowerPoint that we have prepared.
Can everyone see that all right? Yes. All righty. Good morning and thank you for having us Chairman Mills and Commissioners. We appreciate the opportunity to present a summary of the Highway Department's 2020 activities. The big news last year, of course, was COVID-19. The Highway Department, along with all the other county buildings, was closed to the public in late March. We had several office staff begin working remotely. Our maintenance and engineering crew members were assigned separate vehicles and staggered check-in times to minimize potential exposures. And our sto uh, shop staff began working in separate bays. Our buildings became unusually quiet. Even so, we did uh, continue operations as normal and we had a number of staffing changes as this slide shows. Namely, we had the resignation of engineer Foster and the retirement of two individuals, including maintenance foreman Sawyer. Engineer Haas and maintenance supervisor Dix joined us in August and two maintenance workers were hired before year end. As of December 31st, we did have one vacant position and that was that of the longstanding engineering technician vacancy. We have several areas of operations to discuss. The first couple are going to be high visibility and the, the main one, of course, comprises our construction projects. The Highway Department's main 2020 state aid project was the rehabilitation of a little more than five miles of the Gunflint Trail. The details are shown on the screen. Work was substantially complete by year end. Final payment will occur once the silt fence is removed this summer. Our other major state aid project was the Two Island River Bridge. The highway department utilized two 54 foot concrete box culverts to replace the existing bridge. The project cost is shown on the screen as well as some information about the uh, specific nature of this project. This is one of two projects planned for Kramer Road or CASA 1. The other, the Friedenberg Creek culvert, which is a joint project with soil and water is slated for construction this summer. We had some cleanup and some finished work to do on a few projects. And one of those, of course, was South Shore Drive. Paving was delayed in 2019 due to high rains in August and September. So we did pave in the summer of 2020, and then we were able to close that project out. And the final cost, as the screen shows, was $2.8 million. The other area we had to do some closeout was CASA 17. We still had both of those projects, the prep and grading and the paving to officially close out. We did that in 2020 and we ended up paving, of course, uh, about 3.9 miles and rehabilitating 10.1 miles. And the final cost for the two projects was just under $5.5 million. Another high visibility area, of course, is our maintenance program. The next screen is going to be one with a lot of information just because we have those key areas that we report on every year. And so I'll let you look at that. And I will tell you that spring road restrictions vary only by a few days from year to year. In 2019, for example, spring road restrictions began on March 19th, with the first bands lifted on May 14th and the last on June 13th. We did crush more gravel in 2019 due to a lower price. In 2019, class one aggregate was 775 per cubic yard, which enabled us to crush 25,105 yards. You will see in the notes on the screen that we still have a carryover of 9,000 cubic yards from 2020, which we will be crushing this summer. We had again that unforeseen weather caused some problems last fall and it delayed our gravel crushing. Our Price of salt actually went down in 2020. In 2019, it was 89.45 per cubic yard, which is $21.82 more per cubic yard than in 2020. And uh, conversely, sand increased slightly, $2.45 per cubic yard over 2019. There's some information on our lease payments and our allocating money to equipment reserves, which is significant because we will be utilizing that money in an upcoming budget cycle. And then another key area, which isn't high visibility, but which is near and dear to my heart, of course, are the financial statements. 
you will see here that we had a healthy cash balance at the end of uh, 2020. It was 3.35 million. It decreased $7,517 from 2019. Our accounts receivable were down $17,008 from 2019. And due from state aid went from 193,000 in change to the $313,455 shown on the screen. Our allotment balance from MnDOT is up by 1.3 million and inventory value is down $105,000 from 2019. I need to emphasize that that is a normal fluctuation. Our inventory value can run anywhere from about 500 to 650,000 on a given December 31st, just depending on cutting edges and gravel on those things that we might have in stockpiles. And so we expect that to change from year to year. Overall department assets increased $1.3 million from 2019. The liabilities category can fluctuate from year to year depending on what bills and payroll are pending at year end. So there's nothing remarkable there, just the normal slight variations. Our deferred revenue, however, went up $735,991 excuse me, $735, from 2019. So almost $736,000 increase in our deferred revenue. And of course, the section that everyone's most curious about, fund balance. This fund balance section details equipment and local bridge reserves, as well as budget carryovers for projects that we weren't able to close out. So you'll see all of those uh, listed there. Our undesignated fund balance was $2.5 million at year end. This is an increase of $769,000. And it's due in large part, of course, to the increase in department assets from 2019 to 2020, and that reallocation of $105,000 that was reserved for inventory at the end of 2019. A lot of information, I know. We are statutorily obligated to do our town road distributions each year. We get that money at the beginning of the year with our other allotments and then we allocate those to the townships with certified town roads by March 15th of every year. You will see uh, the allocations for the two districts that have those, Schroeder and Tofty. The amount doesn't vary much. It went up $137 from 2019. Interestingly, you're gonna see a major change in the 2021 annual report because the board certified over 50 miles of county roads as unorganized township roads in November of 2020. And that increases this unorganized allocation and gives the county highway department approximately 32 to $36,000 of maintenance money to help offset the county road maintenance work. And so that decreases the levy by that amount or reallocates whatever we need to do. And interestingly, another and even more important benefit from allocating or designating those roads as unorganized territory roads is that we are now eligible for town bridge funds for many of our structurally deficient bridges, those that fall on those unorganized township roads. And Engineer Hass has been actively recruiting alternative funding sources for bridges, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Just a quick snapshot of our accounts payable at year end, our salaries um, and benefits payable were down from 2019 by about 20, nine, $30,000. It's not a, a big change. It just depends on how much time uh, in that month of December ends up being paid out in January. So there's nothing unusual about a slight change in that. Our contracts payable did decrease from $378,000 in 2019 to $49,188.41 in 2020. That is due to closing all of those projects that I referenced under the project section. And for the first time in a number of years, we had no long-term lease payables at year end because we made the final payment on that grader that was on a five-year installment plan. So there is nothing to report in that area. This is a, a snapshot from uh, section 16 to 16B in the annual report, and it shows our cash and fund balance reconciliation so that you can see our beginning and ending cash and fund balances. 
And I just want to re uh, remind everyone that that fund balance of 3.3 million includes all of those special reserves, the equipment, the local bridge, the 2020 carryovers, so that our undesignated fund balance is again, $2.5 million as I reported earlier. This is always kind of a fun section to look at. This is our road program maintenance uh, summary that we uh, do for MnDOT. And you can see that our roads are broken down by CASA, CASA, Muni, and County. And just to remind everyone, CASA are those county state aid highways that we report as roads one through 23, that we do receive uh, allotment money from the state of Minnesota for construction and expenses on. The CASA Muni are those same roads in 1 through 23 where the roads fall within the city of Grand Marais. So we have portions of 7 and 12, and then we have roads 9, 10, 15, and 19, or Wisconsin, Broadway, West 5th, and 8th Avenue West. So we have money allocated for those roads as well. And then county roads are roads 24 through 103. And all of those roads are levy dependent. And you will see that this just gives you an overarching view of the main categories. But what's interesting is to look at the cost per mile on those various sections. And you can see them on there. And interestingly, those categories really seem to swing from year to year, depending on where we have maybe more urgent maintenance needs. So for example, in 2019 under CASA, we spent $10,518 per mile in 2019 versus the 8,300 in 92 and 2020. CASA went down as well. I'm, I'm sorry, CASA went up. It was nine, I'm looking at too many years, 9145 in 2019 and 119187 in 2020. And county saw a huge uptick. In 2019, we spent $10,204 per lane mile in uh, the county uh, road designation, roads 24 through 103, and that went up to $14,235.40 in 2020. And 2021, will it'll be fun to see which category has the biggest uptick or decrease, depending on the needs and some of the uh, emergency situations that might arrive. This next slide is just a breakdown of those categories. Again, this is for reporting to MnDOT. And not surprisingly, if you look at 11,500 snow and ice removal, it, that line item comprises the major cost across all categories. And that's always kind of a fun thing to look at. So on CASA, we spent just under $3,800 per mile uh, doing snow and ice removal. In the Muni uh, area, we spent $9,782. And then on county roads, it's significantly lower, primarily because we have mostly gravel roads in the county road designation. And so you can't uh, do a lot of the salt sand application and other things that really drive the cost up on our paved roads. We also report to MnDOT how many projects we have under design every year. If you look at this, you can see that half of our projects are bridge projects. Engineer Hass has been talking at length about the significant concerns we have uh, with our number of structurally deficient bridges. And so we are working to have some designs in hand so that when we do secure funding, we are able to construct. Engineer Hass is working diligently to secure additional funding. The department just learned it's been awarded a $235,000 state park road grant for the Junkle River Bridge on County Road 27. And we are awaiting word on $690,000 in potential bridge bonds for the Sawbill Creek and Alfred Creek bridges on county roads 49 and 28 respectively. And we are so grateful that engineer Hass is working on this. He is, he's bringing us money, which helps with the levy. We have a caption, a, cap, a capsule of the 2021 budget in front of you. You can see that we have $9.6 million in projects that were in the budget. Since we prepared that budget last summer, we have had to delay Pike Lake Road. 
and the Safe Routes to School Trail. And so they are going to be constructed in 22, which brings our project cost down significantly. I've highlighted a couple of other things, gravel crushing, calcium chloride, our capital equipment. You will see that we are using $227,579 in our equipment reserves. Engineer Haas and maintenance supervisor Dix have been working on a capital improvement plan that is sustainable for the next well, about 28 years or so, because that was the, the time frame that they could work with. And we are using reserves to help get us back on track. And we are still looking at making that a sustainable and long-term feasible uh, program without having to dig into reserves, hopefully every year. So we should discuss, you know, if you look at our $14.3 million budget, you'll see that 9.6 is in projects. In a given year, if you take out the projects, which are basically a, all pass-through costs, either through state aid, special grants, transportation sales tax funds, if you take all of that out, then you have our base operating budget, which is pretty consistent. And of course, it runs in that $5 million range, slightly under. So if we're ever looking at what we need for reserves, we look at that base operating budget and we do not include the annual project costs because they swing wildly and are passed through. So we always have to have just a chuckle at the end, hopefully. I don't know if you think we might see a sign like this somewhere in Cook County, but I thought it was rather apropos. And if you have questions, Engineer Haas and I are available. And I do want you to know that the full annual report is on the main highway department webpage if you want to read, you know, 50 pages or so in your spare time. <laughs> questions, anyone? Um, there we go. Yes. Anybody have any questions? Hawkins. Yeah, I, I have a question. Thank you so much for your report. You always do an excellent job and I really appreciate it. I just want a little bit of clarification about the summary of road program maintenance costs and all those things listed out there. Mm -hmm. And it says dust treatments. And then I looked at the numbers and I'm thinking, when I'm thinking dust treatments, I'm thinking calcium chloride. What do you mean by dust treatments? That is what we do mean. That is the cost for purchasing it as well as the staff time. We have one individual who accompanies the sprayers to make sure that we are spraying exactly where we want on every road. And so, yes, that's the primary uh, cost in that category. So that's the cost to apply it. It's not the cost for the, for the calcium chloride. Okay. Uh, I just, no, it's, both. it's all of it. Does it look like it was $6,000 or, and so, oh. I got to pull up my, uh, my, my handout is too small to read. Let me go back here. Sorry. Dust treatments. Oh, you're right. I apologize. That is that is the cost to apply it. I apologize. It's uh, the actual cost for the calcium chloride goes under. Um, I'd have to pull it up, but it's up under the routine maintenance. So right. yes. Thank you. I just you know little things stick out, and I'm like, I wonder how that works. So thank you for you are, you are correct. answering. Okay. Uh, I believe if I look at my Excel spreadsheet, it actually goes under um, 110600. We've got a subcategory because it is a traffic service. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. I apologize. Mr. Hawkins, and thank you, Ms. Sarley. Uh, Mr. Yorkey. Yes, I just want to echo uh, Commissioner Hawkins' comments. Great presentation, Lisa. And I just want to recognize the great work of the leadership team in the highway department. Robbie, Josh, Lisa, and Randy are just a superb team. They're really doing an excellent job for us. I know the, uh, and this predates my arrival here, but I know that um, there's there's kind of a checkered past in the highway department. I think that's fairly well known in the in the county, but um, you know, this team is just doing such a great job in, in so many different ways. In fact, just yesterday, got an email about um, 
Robbie's involvement with uh, folks up the Gunflint and, and Poplar Lake. And I uh, just want to say, you know, I really, really appreciate the great work that you all are doing. Thank you for that so much. Um, I also wanted to ask on the uh, town road allocation page, and Lisa, you may have mentioned this, but I was trying to absorb the numbers, so I may not have heard you. Um, I saw that um, Schroeder and Tofty both get allocations, but Lutzen's not eligible. And what, what is the reason for that? Lutzen does not have any certified township roads. And so mm -hmm. they have to certify those to us each year by November 15th. We send out a letter as directed by Minda. They are to respond and they can let us know if there are any changes which can happen as you know we now have certified miles so we have to certify ours and we did get some maintenance allocation for 2021 and then when we recertify this fall we'll get that again for 2022. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, thank you Ms. Farley. Uh, any other questions? Any or hear any? I'd, I'd also echo how, how grateful I am for your work and, and the clarity in presentations and and willingness to answer our our questions. Um, much appreciated. Thank you, Chairman um, Mills. That, thank you. Have a great day. Everyone. The good work in the upcoming year. You you as well. Um, it appears my video has frozen, but I will carry on here. I can't see, so please, someone interrupt if I'm um, missing something. Uh, we're moving on to item number seven. This is MIS and the Inco contract for the Col Colville Tower BDA. And I did see uh, Mr. Well, there he is, Mr. Watkins. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and members of the board. Thank you. Um, Today we're, we're seeking approval pending any and all recommended changes by County Attorney Hicken to enter into a contract with Vinco for site development and tower construction required for the Colville BDA. Um, the, the BDA is a project we've discussed here several times in the past, um, but that project was initiated at the recommendation of the Cook County 911 Communications Committee to address a, a lack of armor coverage along Highway 61 in that area. Um, this specific contract would be paid for out of tower capital, the tower capital account, and that revenue is generated from uh, tower leases and therefore has no impact on the levy. And uh, this project was identified in the uh, 2021 budget and we received a, a couple quotes and this was, this is the one that we're recommending. Um, came in significantly lower uh, and part of that is because uh, we were able to reach out to the contractor that was awarded the AT&T build out at Gunflint Lake by AT&T um, and look to, to capitalize on, on taking advantage of them already being in our area and saving on the mobilization cost of having the crane and the tower crew and the other equipment required to do this um, already in our area. And, and the, the quote reflects that. So um, I would stand for, for any questions. Do you have any questions this morning, commissioners? We've, I think we've seen this coming. You've, you've been very uh, forthright in, in all the steps, and I really appreciate the, the ongoing work there and, and the clarity with, with all these steps and, and just uh, being able to pay for it with, uh, with the fund and the lease. That's Thank you. Well, hearing or seeing no other questions, I would entertain a motion. Woman? I'd like to move to approve the contract for $170,700 with Vinco to develop the site and erect the tower required. Commissioner Swallowson, second. Thank you, Commissioner Swallowson. We have a motion and support. Uh, for the discussion, Attorney Hicken. Thank you. Um, Mr. Watkins, does this include the cost of the bonds, the performance and payment bonds that we talked about? Uh, the great, great point. Uh, thank you. The 
number that was entered is 170,700 and uh, it does not. So uh, about another- uh, I think 1%, they said, right? 1%, right. So an additional 1% for the required performance and payment bonds um, would need to also be spent. Very good point. Thank you for the clarification there. Um, is, would this be a time to ask for an amendment to the motion? Alden? I'd be happy to amend my motion um, to add the 1%. And Swallows in support. All right, any, any further, further discussion? Hearing none and seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Starley? Aye. Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, we have unanimous, unanimous approval. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Thank you very much. Great day. You too. Brings us on to item number eight uh, with the assessor. Uh, the first one, item A, is a service contract for Leo and Clearwater Landings. Uh, assessor Thompson, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mills and commissioners. <clears throat> um, the first item I have here is that contract for the Leo Lake and Clearwater Landings. I got a call last week um, from the contractor who's been doing it for the past few years. It was something that wasn't on my radar. Um, basically, they had asked if we were going to renew that contract. And, you know, given the, the, the timing of the contract, they had already started cleaning um, the week of the fishing opener. So I pulled open the file. I, did, I was able to find last year's contract, and this is essentially the same as last year's. Um, I, I did speak with Administrator Yorkie yesterday. I don't know a lot of the history on this contract, and I think it is something that would be worthwhile for us to um, to review and and see if you know maybe we need to put an RFP out or or to see if this contract um, needs to be revised at all. I know one of the things that's interesting to me is it lists Leo Lake, and there's not a sanitary facility at Leo Lake currently which actually is something we've discussed in the past because there have been some issues there with, uh, you know, not having a sanitary facility. So I'm going to do a little more research on this and um, try and get to the bottom of, you know, whether or not this contract used to include a, a facility at the Leo Lake and whether or not that's something we need to, to revisit. But the contract does state that we uh, can cancel, either party could cancel with a two weeks notice. So um, I am going to still make the recommendation so that we don't get uh, backlogged up there with, without having somebody clean the facility for the, the interim. Um, so that would be my recommendation and, and I will bring back to the board, uh, you know, if there's a review or, or a need for a, a new contract. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, any questions? Commissioner Hawkins. Thank you. So I'm just curious if we had a contract for Leo Lake, but we had no sanitary facilities, what was the work done there? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hawkins and uh, Chairman Mills. I believe there was a revision of the contract there, it looks like back in 2011. And I'm wondering if, you know, at some point, maybe there was a sanitary facility at Leo. I don't know if anybody on this, this call could recall or, or knows, has that knowledge, but I've got a call in with G&G &G Septic to see if they could tell me the answer to that. I've also been reaching out to the contractor here. Um, since last Monday, I've tried calling and, and I haven't um, been able to get in touch with them to, to try and get some of those more specific details. But that was uh, certainly something that I was, you know, given that it's listed in the contract, I'm wondering, you know, if there was in the past or, or if it's something that we need to look at including and, and uh, if there is um, time being put into going and, and cleaning there. You know, obviously the, the contract lists a sanitary facility specifically, but the, you know, the contractor may still be going there and, and picking up trash, I'm not sure. So 
Um, I will certainly be continuing on trying to get a little more information on this. And I, um, I do want to point out to the commissioners here is that, that the financial implications are $80 a week. I uh, forgot to adjust it for a five month contract. So the, the yearly um, is, is the number is 1680 for the annual contract on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any other questions? See any? I don't hear any. Would entertain a motion. Still entertaining. Okay. I'm I'm just wondering what the hesitancy is everybody else um i get i'm kind of have some hesitancy that we're approving a contract that we might have to rewrite rewrite in two weeks and that yeah caused me some concern that this maybe wasn't thought out but i do think we need we're we're a tourism industry County, <laughs> we have to we have to clean. And if we've had that responsibility, I don't think we can just stop, even though we don't think this process is right. So, I guess I'm going to make the motion to approve this contract for services at Clearwater and Leo Lakes. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion. Is there support? Sullivan supports. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion and support. Uh, any further discussion? Um, and I'll first just say, I, I agree with you, Commissioner Hawkins. That's, I think that's probably the, the long and short of it. You, you said it very well. And, and that it, my impression is that Mr. Thompson is, is, is and will be looking into this, uh, the details to, to refine this and to have a, a better understanding. So your concerns, I, I think our concerns will, will, uh, will be addressed. Um, Commissioner Storley, you unmuted. Did you also have um, um, some discussion points? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, any other discussion points? Oh, Mr. Yorkie, sorry. Yeah, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to thank Bob for his diligence in following through on this. Uh, we did talk about this yesterday, and and um, <clears throat> there was there was some question about whether we should defer this item. But again, because those facilities do need to be cleaned, uh, and I agree with you com completely, Commissioner Hawkins, uh, we wanted to move forward with this while we figure out what's happening at Leo Lake. Um, and once we have that information, we'll make any adjustments that are needed. So in the meantime, this enables us to make sure that those facilities continue to be maintained uh, so that our visitors to Cook County are well served. And, and locals. And locals, through that. Very good. Um, thank you, Mr. Yorkey. Any, any further discussion? I don't see any, I don't hear any. I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous approval. Thank you, commissioners, and, and thank you, Mr. Thompson. Second item is uh, item B, property tax abatements. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Chairman Mills. Um, so we have uh, four abatements listed here. Um, you know, abatements kind of come throughout the, the entire year, depending on the situation. But every once in a while, you seem to get these like batches of them. It, it seems to happen during TNT and then also kind of when the first payments do. So there's four different ones here. I'm not sure if you guys want to go through them individually, or I can give you an overview of all four of them, and then you can make a motion on all four. But I, I would defer to uh, Chairman Mills how you want to proceed on those. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, I think we could we could do a, a um, well. I guess just right off the bat, any any questions from commissioners about any of them individually? 
All right. Well, shall we go through them one by one? That. Please, Mr. Thompson, let's let's do that. Okay. Thank oh, I'm you. sorry, uh, Commissioner. Uh, one moment, sorry. sorry, Commissioner Hawkins, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just had some more clarification. So I'm not opposed to if somebody wants to make motion to approve all four, as long as we get all clarification. That's all I meant. Sorry. Not at all. No, I think uh, that's that's very good. Um, I, I think it's I think it's worthwhile going through uh, briefly one by one, uh, Assessor Thompson, if you would. Okay, thank you, Chairman and, Mills. And then, so, and then we can do maybe a, a bulk uh, a bulk motion after that. Okay, thank you, Chairman Mills. Um, so the first one here, it's listed under Olson. The abatement is a value reduction to the 2020 assessment. Um, this was uh, down in the Cascade Beach Road. It was in our 2020 um, inspection for the 2021 valuation for that quintile. There was a slight reduction to that 2021. Um, the increase was part of a neighborhood adjustment where everything had gone up. We did not get an appeal last year. Uh, Mrs. Olson was having some hardships, so she was unable to appeal. She did satisfy to my, um, you know, my understanding that she did meet that definition of a hardship. So she applied for the 2020 and her, her 2021 value is adjusted to reflect that inspection. I actually went out there about a month ago and, and walked through the interior of the property down there. So um, that is the first one. The second one is the Peterson abatement. And this is one I've worked with attorney Hicken on, you know, we've had some discussions about this. Um, essentially, uh, the property was identified as um, commercial because it, or it was classified commercial because there was no response to our questionnaires. Um, oh, sorry, this is a different one. The Peterson abatement is just a change to the 3A commercial to seasonal recreational. This one was because the unit number was incorrectly identified uh, when we were going through identifying short-term rentals. The, the Hanson abatement, the third one down, is the one that I've worked with attorney Hicken on. Now this one is a little bit unique. Um, we have been you know, mailing the questionnaires to the address that we have on file for the taxpayer. We didn't get any responses and, and our default, our, our policy was to say that those would go to a commercial classification. Then the taxpayer still has an opportunity to appeal during the board of appeals. Uh, we didn't get an appeal. However, we did get um, the abatement application and we've discovered that the, the taxpayer did receive the tax statement. Um, this is because we outsource all those to a, to a vendor and they inquire with the United States Postal Service about updated and forwarded addresses. Then anyone who has an updated or current address with the U United States Postal Service, they'll forward the mail automatically. They, they send us a list of those and there's 259 addresses on the list from last year, 154 of those, they provide the updated or current address that, that they've, they've transferred their mail to. So, um, you know, attorney Hicken and I kind of looked at this and said that, you know, if, if uh, we're getting a list provided to, to update these addresses, we should at least be making an effort to, uh, to, to update those addresses when we get those. So we kind of looked at this one and said that this one would, would fall under the definition of an error or, or you know, a reason to create a policy that would update addresses when, when we're provided by our outsourcer. So that would be a commercial change to seasonal residential uh, or seasonal recreational. We did identify that it wasn't rented over 183 days. It was also used as a cabin, so it falls in. Had we just gotten the responses initially, this would have never ended up as a commercial uh, use. And the last one is uh, for a lot here in town that was developed back in you know, 2018, 2019. And when, when we went in and added in the improvements to the record, to the vacant land record, it was missed to change the classification. Typically, we, we can't do that change immediately. We have to actually wait until we close off the, the current open assessment book to apply that classification change. So typically what we do is we put in what's called an error or, or an issue, and that will set a specific date that we have to review this file and, and update that classification. So, you know, of all the new construction that we get on vacant land, this is one that just happened to get missed and it, and it happened to get missed for two years before it was caught. So it's a refund and a reduction for 2020 and 2021. Are there any commissioner, uh, questions from commissioners?
Mr. I just want to say thank you for the clarification. Um, yeah, I had concerns about the not responding to the letter that we tried to make sure everybody uh, saw and knew what was going to happen. So um, that that was the one that I mostly had concerns about. Thank you for clarifying. And thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Any other questions? Are any motions? Make a motion to approve the abatements uh, that, as noted by Assessor Thompson. Thank you, Commissioner Salson. We have a motion. Is there support? Starley support. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Storley? I'm sorry, Commissioner Storley. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Hawkins? Aye. Mr. Mills is aye as well. Uh, we have unanimous approval. Uh, thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, guys. A wonderful day. And um, this brings us down to item nine. It also brings us to 10 o'clock. And so I would request that we take a 10 minute break here and, um, and regroup at 10 10. And uh, Mr. Lane, thank you for, for being here, and, and we'll, we'll meet again at 10 10. Not a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Bill. Bill, do you hear me? I'm going to send you an email. Hey, Bill, I'm going to send you an email, okay? Thank you. 
realized I made an error because um, I think my computer is two minutes slower than that last time. So when I said 10, mm-hmm. 10 probably meant 10, 12 on everyone, in everyone else's world. So we'll, we'll give uh, give another minute or two here. Am I... Well, now we have everybody, though. Thank. Well, now I want my two minutes. <laughs> fair enough, Mr. Land, fair <laughs> enough. It's okay. <laughs> very, very good. Well, uh, we're all back here, I think. And um, yeah. Under the item. Well, of course, uh, this is item number nine, land services. And the uh, first one, A, is the request for an inter- interim use permit to establish a home business in the FAR 3 overlay district on the property adjacent to the Sawbill Trail. Elaine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, commissioners and others. Uh, this is a request from uh, John and Gail Thompson on the Sawbill Trail. And actually, this is a the, the culmination of a communication consultation process that began last fall um, during which they came into land services and identified a home business operation, uh, which is their Sawbill Gardens, which is the the nomenclature that they used to label their business operation. And in September of 2020, uh, I directly told the Thompsons to apply for a conditional use permit and unfortunately they didn't and so all of a sudden we come into the springtime with a garden operation with perennials annuals things that have short life terms uh and and so we really expedited this process to get the thompsons into at least a a a salvable salvageable position to at least have some of their uh, commercial business operations in play for what remains of the spring planting season. So uh, the planning commission uh, conducted a special meeting uh, last Wednesday and uh, we had some Zoom connection problems, but ultimately we're able to get a quorum for that meeting and listen to the Thompson's uh, uh, request and had some very minor discussions. If you saw the Planning Commission meeting review, it was very, very non-communicative as far as opinions, and, which basically segmented into a unanimous approval for the Thompsons to have their uh, business operation established as a conditional use permit. We put it into an interim use permit with a five-year window. Uh, the conditions are on your draft resolution, which was included in your packet. It was really an, a non-issue as far as impacts to the neighborhood. The Thompsons have been excellent to work with. Uh, they, they have a resource that's necessary uh, on the West End and even throughout Cook County. And they're very excited about this opportunity. And so the Planning Commission voted unanimously to approve uh, their interim use permit request and forward it to the Board of Commissioners with a recommendation for your subsequent approval. Lane. Uh, any commissioners have any questions or concerns for Mr. Lane? Commissioner Swanson. Just a clarification, Mr. Lane. What made it move into the interim use versus uh, staying with the conditional use? Well, that that and Commissioner Swanson, that that's an op- that's an option that we have through Article 10 of the Cook County Zoning Ordinance. That any permit that can be considered conditional can also be considered interim. And what we've seen is that historically, conditional use permits are are typically running with the property. So you can have a use that was approved in 1980, which is archaic by all current property ownership uh, guidance, but can still be invigorated. The interim use permit is one of those things that gives us a little more uh, feedback ability. So we can induct, we can conduct reviews uh, things like that. And the Thompsons agreed to that. I mean, we, this wasn't, we didn't just spring this on them. This was a conversation and, and they agreed to it. Uh, you know, 
so it's a it's a pretty seamless transition just a different title of the permit okay thank you i i just wanted to know just for my clarification and understanding thank you thank you commissioner Swalson, and thank you mr lane um you know it's it's getting into the watching the the planning commission meetings it's it's word is it's going to get quite busy there and uh and so it's good for us to get more of this background and process in place so that we're more familiar with making decisions going forward too. So thank you. Question and for the clarification. Uh, any other questions, concerns, comments? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Storley. Thank you. And thank you, Bill, for bringing the group together to expedite this. Um, there's a lot of things when you think about starting a new business and and, um, and especially when you're dealing with plants. And um, <clears throat> I know they'll have, I visited the site a couple of times. I know they'll have good success. And I know, especially right now, people are looking forward to buying gardening things and they'll extend all the way into the fall. So thank you on that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. Really? Uh, any any other questions, comments, concerns from commissioners? Uh, mm -hmm. I had a question. Just um, how how the five year uh, time frame was was determined? Uh, that's just a nice round annual number. Um, you know, there's no there's no intent behind it. It's just you know, if it's a conditional use permit, it runs into perpetuity. Uh, if things change on the property or they, they disband their operation, that sort of thing, um, that, that just keeps, it keeps the, the regulatory finger on the pulse, so to speak, for these types of operations. I have no doubt that, that the Thompsons will conduct a, a successful business there. Um, but it's also nice to uh, when they come back in in five years, if there are changes that need to be implemented or reactions from the neighbors, we can address those as part of a new permitting process. So it's really just to have that tactile communication uh, with the applicant. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have a problem with the five years. I was just curious about process. And, um, and I think that is probably a a fair number to reassess things and change significantly in that in that time period as well, both on their end as well as the neighborhood's end or, or our community's end. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you for that clarification there. Um, well, yet again, my screen has frozen, um, but I would entertain a motion if, if there are no further questions, comments, or concerns. Please speak up Mr. as Chair. I can see. Uh, Commissioner Starley. <laughs> yes, you are frozen in time. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the um, Sawbill Garden Center on Sawbill Trail. Thank you, Commissioner oh. Starley. Wallison supports. You're muted, Chairman. You know, okay. I was going to say I could see again and I can hear, but um, any any uh, we have we have a, a motion uh, and support. Any further discussion? See any? I don't hear any. I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Swalson. Aye. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Hawkins. Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous approval. Uh, thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Mr. Lane. That moves us on to uh, item B, a request for an interim use permit to establish a dog kennel in the FAR 3 zone district adjacent to County 14 in Frank's Way. Uh, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a uh, interim use permit, as mentioned, for a kennel operation. Obviously, you have uh, been apprised of uh, concerns and uh, 
but also I hope that you've read the packet uh, because it does give a, a fairly comprehensive background on this. Kennels, as we know, are part of the Cook County legacy. Uh, they are identified readily in the land use guide plan and the Cook County zoning ordinance. And in fact, uh, article 10 does have a specific uh, mention of kennels, including criteria for kennel operations. So those are all issues that came into play. Uh, Mr. Langang came in uh, a couple months ago with the, uh, the proposal for a, a kennel operation up on County Road 14 Franks Way landscape. And that is an area where there have been historic kennels and, and the most recent kennel operation was in 2008, which was on an adjacent five acre parcel uh, to the immediate Northeast of Mr. Langang's parcel. Um, when we started to do our discovery process on this, a couple of things that we look at are, are the landscape, the adjacent property uses and that sort of thing. Um, there are several large kennels in the immediate landscape. Uh, the Beals have one down on County Road 60 and Jorgensen uh, has one over on Frank's Way. And uh, Tim White had a historic kennel, but he's in, that is in, uh, I don't know how many dogs he has up there now, but that would have been a, a, a continuing non-conforming use or a grandfathered kennel from back in the 70s, I believe. So when we get this application, we are duty bound to go out and look at the property, investigate, see what the conflicts, if any, are. And from that, uh, we derive our narrative, which is uh, at this point from a regulatory perspective is trying to make everything fit within the constraints, meaning the land use guide plan and the Cook County zoning ordinance, but also in deference to the neighborhood, because this is a there are aesthetic conflicts here, as there are with any use in any neighborhood, depending upon the aesthetics that are identified. Um, for this case, uh, a couple of our land services concerns, and I walked the site with Mitch Travis, our wetland uh, authority, were the, the fact that it is a narrow property and we do have an inherent 100 foot uh, property line setback from the property line into any dog kennel yarding areas. And there, that was further conflicted with some of the uh, wetland resource. And that's been alluded to uh, not only in the narrative, but also in, in the generated comments from uh, adjacent property owners. So in, in looking at the, the application itself, uh, Mr. Langang originally came in with a 45 dog kennel request and uh, what we did and what I did, what land services did is try and look and see whether or not that is, is uh, a candidate for uh, uh, accommodation or modification and seeing the constraints of the property, um, seeing the narrow width of that, seeing the proximity to a pretty significant wetland complex, which ultimately becomes a protected waterway and, and enters into the Cadence River. Um, so we came up with this idea of reducing the number of dogs, putting this into an interim use permit as a kind of show and show and tell, let's see what you can do. Let's see how your activity, again, which is a land use guide plan, uh, asterisk use um, and see how that pans out. So. Our, our accommodation, our um, uh, you know, meeting halfway on this was mindful of the concerns of the property owners, but also mindful that this is a, an identified conditional use in the Cook County Zoning Ordinance. So uh, what our uh, approach was, was to reduce the number of dogs to 20 um, and uh, put two annual reviews in 2021 and 2022, and then have provide Mr. Line Gang with the option to come back in and reinvigorate the permitting process. And at that point, if he demonstrates compliance, if there are no issues in the neighborhood, if there, if it's a seamless fit with the conditions that we've derived, then he can opt to increase the number of dogs and that sort of thing provided they meet the constraints that are already inherent to the use. 
So um, in discussion, the planning commission and in this meeting lasted an hour. So there was a lot of discussion. Uh, there was some uh, concern. There was also some disbelief and incredulity. incredulity. Um, and so the, the, the issue became, what is a reasonable compromise here? Um, and the, what the planning commission came up with was to allow a slight deviation from the recommended 20 dogs to 25 dogs to accommodate puppies. We, we all love puppies and puppies happen. And so that would be an allowance within the, the kennel operation. Um, but the other thing was to have a fairly firm review process, uh, including uh, uh, deference to Minnesota Rule 7030, which is our noise uh, assessment. And that's done on, with a scientific instrument and that sort of thing. But also, you know, this is, this is, this is a tough parcel and um, wetland issues are there. And I think in making that compromise, the, the idea was, um, let's see if we, can, if we can accommodate this within the constraints that are already there via landscape and regulatory authority. So uh, the vote was four to one. Uh, in favor of uh, what the resolution came out to be. And I gave you a draft resolution of that. Uh, and that includes the number of dogs and also the constraints that are there for the, um, uh, the use itself and including the two annual reviews. So four to one, the planning commission uh, voted to approve uh, as identified and as presented and forwarded it to the board of commissioners with a recommendation for your subsequent approval. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, any questions uh, from commissioners? Commissioner Salson? Yes, Mr. Lane. Um, during public comment, there was a comment made that uh, Mr. Travis had revisited the property uh, as recently as yesterday and had, it was stated, had found further accommodations that appeared to make this more viable. Are you aware of that or had conversations, Mr. Travis, related to those? Uh, Commissioner Svelson, uh, no, I have. Mitch, Mitch just came into the office. He was out in the field. Um, you know, I would, I would defer to him on that evaluation. I think anytime you get a third person assessment, it's going to deviate significantly from the actual assessment. Um, and so I would defer to Mitch. Um, you know, that's all I can tell you. I don't know if he's still next door, but uh, certainly that would be uh, his authority on this is critical to the overall good fit component here. And yeah, you clearly, clearly understood and wasn't, I, I was just looking to see if that information had been passed on and because um, certainly I wasn't there to, to hear it directly. I was just trying to respond to something stated earlier. Understood, yep. Thank you, Commissioner Swalson, and thank you, Mr. Lane. Any, any other questions from commissioners? Chairman Mills. Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in order for me to visualize what this all would look like on seven acres, I live on almost five acres, um, I did take a little drive up there. <clears throat> and uh, viewed the property and I'm coming at it from a property person observation. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property. I mean, there's great trees. Um, all of that will have to be taken down. Um, it seems like from County Road 14, boggy, wet area, then it looks like it climbs up a ways. So on this seven acres, um, the developer will have to go back uh, a ways to do any kind of uh, building. Um, there's no improvements on the property, so there's no well, and dogs need water, so we're going to have to figure out, you know, where to put that. <clears throat> the wetlands with me is a big issue. Um, as Bill stated, the property lines, um, it's a narrow property, um, and the flat, the fact that 
anything flowage out of the land goes into Kadunks is concerning. Um, and the amount of land for the dogs, for 20 or 25 dogs, just um, to me uh, seems pretty uh, narrow um, to be able to accommodate that many dogs on this particular land. The conditional use, I think, um, I have trouble with because um, I would assume that the property owner would go above and beyond all means of meeting the constraints um, <clears throat> and noise assessment and all that. So now he has 20 or some dogs and um, he has not met all that. So then my concern is what happens to the dogs? You know, it's a big investment and I would hope that um, the privilege, if that would be, that um, under the conditional use, he would go above and beyond what the requirement would be. So I'm coming at it from a land use um, and um, I think it's too much to put on that piece of land. Mr. Storley, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had an opportunity to visit the property on three occasions um, because I do attend the planning commission meetings. So back prior to May 12th, I attended the property and I've been out there at different times of the day. I also have friends who are mushers. Um, I really support the, su the sport of mushing and think Cook County is a great place for individuals to come here to um, make their dream come true. And I know historically County Road 14 has had a mushing tradition. But as I visited the property, I found that it's primarily residential, that the kennels that do exist for the most part, not only in this area, but throughout Cook County, have larger parcels of land. They have 20, 40, or even 80 acres. And that sometimes these dog yards move because of urine and excrement and, and so they are, the dog yards are moved around. And I thought about that being a dog person and looked at this space to try to visualize where that yard would be and could it even be moved? Um, I had the per same perception of the property as Commissioner Storley. I believe it's too narrow and um, for noise issues as well, uh, too close to other residents. Um, so I feel it's really incompatible with the neighborhood. Um, and um, I've based that again on three observations at the site and also visiting other kennels at different times of the day and listening to the noise level when either an animal appears in the area or when it's feeding time. Sullivan. Um. Any, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Swalson. Yeah, I, I also took the opportunity to visit this uh, property and visit with the neighbors, um, and had discussions with them. Um, I, I do agree that the, uh, this, this lot has its challenges. Uh, I believe that the planning commission has properly evaluated those challenges and provided uh, you know, that it does have, there is the opportunity to meet the requirements. We certainly do in our zoning and planning call out this area as an area that can be utilized for this purpose. Um, so it's, it's one that is, you know, I go both ways. I, I'd certainly want the, the neighbors to be able to properly enjoy their properties in a quiet fashion but I've also chatted with quite a number of mushers and I also have done some reviews and it, I have not found where there have been noise. Uh, they, they, as far as the limits set by the state have not been found to be challenged by these operations. And so I, I'm, I'm inclined you know, to look at this from the planning commission. They've put some strict requirements on this um, and, and given the inspection opportunities, I, I find it hard to not allow the homeowner to attempt 
and to demonstrate, in fact, that he can meet those requirements. Commissioner Salson, um, does that trigger any, any further discussion or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Hawkins? Yeah, I just want to say I also visited the property or, or looked at it and talked to, visited some other mushers. You know, being born and raised in Cook County, I realized I really had no knowledge of the mushing, you know, industry and kennels. And so it was very helpful for me because I also had very huge concerns that this is such a narrow lot, how are we going to fit this on there? So I went out and looked at places and um, one area had you know, almost 50 dogs, I think, and it was cleared, big area. Dogs were not barking when I was visiting at all. The only dog barking then was their house pet dog. None of the other dogs cared. Then I saw another area where there were like 20 dogs. And actually I was surprised that it didn't take up as much space as I thought it did. And so it was very helpful. And there were trees around. It's like those dogs were in shade. So it's not like we have to do this big clear cut to uh, do this. Um, do I have concerns about the wetlands? And I did talk to um, Mitch Travis about that. So now hearing that he went out there again and revised the map that he sent me, it's like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm wondering. And then, you know, seeing the map that was included in the packet here and where it says my house and it just, I had concerns about where the actual property lines were and the actual dimensions. Things just didn't seem to scale with the map that um, Mitch originally sent me about where the wetlands are and I couldn't match it up. So I'm all for people being able to use their um, property in permitted ways. So I'm just expressing my um, concern, but in the conditions, like number two, it says that it, we're going to make sure they conform to Wetland Conservation Act criteria. And number five, we're going to have them put a berm in. Mr. Lane, can you explain to me about that berm and how it's built and how high it is? And where? Uh, great question. Commissioner Hawkins, um, that is a, a relatively subjective uh, question. Um, the, the big thing is, is that there does, there does need to be some sort of barrier whenever you get into a slope versus proximity to a wetland resource or a water resource. The, the kennel ordinance itself does identify a hundred foot setback from any protected waterway. And we just applied that to uh, the the wetland uh, interface between the yard and the wetland resource. So, you know, we would we would invoke uh, erosion and sediment control standards, uh, perhaps in uh, uh, an organic berm with silt fence, that sort of thing. Whatever whatever is a surface element would be impounded or uh, otherwise detracted from running into the wetland resource. So um, again, there is no model for that. We would invoke the slope, the amount of run area, which is the area that all this is collecting and, and uh, depositing and do something that we would evaluate af after its implementation. another question so you're going to do inspections two inspections one at the end of every year and I'm just wondering how you chose the end of the year or do you have only one and I, I guess I'm just wondering how how you chose that yeah I mean there there's no formula for this we in the last five years we've done a lot more interim use permits with the ability to invoke that review. Uh, we've done it for a couple of places up on 44 and 45. Um, and so there isn't, it isn't an exact science. It's just 
you know, typically uh, it's all predicated on the end of the, re the year review for gravel pits. Every year we review the gravel pits at the end of the year. So this just slots into that kind of the prevailing approach that we have that will put it at the end of the year. And then that allows an opportunity to adjust or that sort of thing. So there's no science to it. It's just a, just being a transparent regulatory process. Thank you. I was just wondering, is it better to do your inspections in the winter or is it better to do it in the summer? I you know that's, I was just curious about that. Well, in, in the fact that the inspection is identified at the end of the year doesn't mean we can't go out during the middle of the year, during the growing season, during a high precipitation event, things like that. that this is no different than a stormwater process where the permit is in place and it's the regulatory responsibility to go out and check different conditions and see how the, the uh, prescribed uh, management options are holding up in to different weather regimes and that sort of thing. Commissioner Smallson. So Mr. Lane, as I understand it, 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 it could, an inspection isn't tied, you know, you don't have to wait till the end of the year, as I understood you. It could be triggered by whether it's environmental or whether you were getting uh, complaints from uh, people in the neighborhood that maybe this wasn't being run as anticipated. Those could also trigger you to go out and have an inspection to see if all the criteria that was in the uh, permit were, were being met. Is that correct? Correct. And, and you know, I, I think if, if there is a desire to modify that condition to invoke a uh, non end of the year visits and things like that. We'll do that anyways. I don't know how formalized you want it to be. It isn't just, you know, if the permit's approved, we just we just put it on our on our short stack. You know, we we do engage with this because this is it isn't just the property owner, it's the adjacent property owners. And we have that responsibility to make sure that anybody who owns land in Cook County has the right to enjoy their property and, and contentment. Yeah, and as I as I understood it, and you know, I've heard the I've heard the concerns of uh, the the neighbors, um, and I think you know I understand their concerns clearly. I also understand what's in the permitting process and the restrictions that are being put in. They appear to me to be aimed directly at those concerns, um, both on waste um, and on the standoffs and from the noise perspective. So it appears to me that we're addressing those and it's really incumbent upon the landowner to demonstrate that they can meet those criteria. Commissioner Hawkins. Yes, so there is a structure already on this property. Are there plans for a well and septic? Um, I'm not sure. I would assume so, but that, you know, that's a property owner decision that, you know, I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have any influence on his request. He, he can have a rustic resident. There's, there's a kennel up on Mush Lake that is completely off the grid um, and, and they function very well. And uh, so it, that really isn't uh, part of this permitting process. It's a consideration, but not ours. I guess on that note, um, if we could look at, oh, I don't know how we can best look at the narrative here. It's handwritten, says five of 12 on the page I'm looking at. I think it is probably item 10 where it talks specifically about um, Kennel, kennel conditional use permit, uh, Article 10, there it is at the top of the page. Um, it says the facility operations plan shall contain the following information. If we get on to item E, the site plan to include down to item six, location of wells and septic systems. Uh, number seven, location of dwellings on the property. And so far in the drawings that I've seen in the packet of the plan, uh, neither of those are identified. And so it'd be helpful for 
us and frankly for the planning commission to uh, be aware of those items specifically in the site plan. And, and Mr. Chair, uh, just so you know that there are standards for setbacks for those two resources. It isn't like you can just bunch everything in by the well and and septic area, that sort of thing. So those are those are permitting standards that would be part of the administrative process that don't necessarily have to be uh, implemented into the interim use process. Oh, so we don't need that for the site plan? Well, if it isn't there, I mean, you can't say, well, this is where my well is going to be. And then a McKeever's go out there and they find out, well, that's not where your well is going to be. It's going to be up here. I mean, it's just, it's a variable that we can't accommodate unless it's part of that, that individual property landscape. Yeah, so the location of the dwelling, would that, that, that seems to be part of the, a necessary part of the site plan that I'm not aware of. Yeah, that, that's informative only. He, that's up at the northern part of his parcel. It isn't even, it's probably three, 400 feet from where his proposed yard is, maybe even more, okay. I'm not really sure. Yeah, and so um, one of the things I, I learned from listening to the planning commission meeting, um, was that there's different types of operations, right? Uh, makes sense. There's people with three dogs, uh, people with, well, then they don't need a permit, people with five dogs, uh, or, or uh, as I believe um, uh, Commissioner Laboda um, stated that, you know, there's the Iditarod teams that are, that are much larger. And so, um, and then, you know, it kind of led me to, to understand, well, there's, there's racing teams and then there's, there's, a breeding operation that's, you know, primarily meant to um, breed the dogs. And so, in this case, is this uh, where does this where does this application fall? As far as numbers, as far as the type of operation, I I, I don't know. I, I, you know, there's a there's a property across County Road 14 where there's a, a 90 dog allowance for a conditional use permit, that's still technically valid. So, you know, I, I think in talking with Mr. Lion Gang, you know, this is kind of his entry level effort into this as an outlet for his passion. He's demonstrated that. Um, that doesn't mean he's more entitled to uh, to approaching his passion or anything like that. But I, you know, his operation is going to be wholly dependent on how he conducts his operation. Yeah, I'm just trying to go down the checklist here. Um, and so uh, item 1B is type of kennel operation. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting into the weeds here. I, I do have expectations that the Planning Commission would get into these weeds. Um, and, and the questions that rose to my head were not addressed at the Planning Commission, and so I apologize for, for getting into it now. It's, it's not good process, and, um, and I do apologize for that. But I do think it's important because, uh, much like Commissioner Sullivan stated, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that's, that's in our land use plan and something that I think is a real unique part of Cook County culture that I really want to see uh, flourish and I want to see more of. And in order for that to, to happen, we need to have uh, successful, well-planned operations. Um, and, and so I want to make sure that we're going down the checklist, we're covering all our bases. And, uh, and I am far from comfortable at this point. Uh, please, Mr. Lane. And, and Mr. Chair, you know, I, I understand the itemization. Condition one is that all land use parameters established by the Cook County Kennel Ordinance, including set, setback distances, buffers, well protection, noise, and environmental considerations will be incorporated into kennel operations. That inclusion of the kennel ordinance itself, um, there are other items that aren't mentioned in that, but the inclusion 
of the kennel ordinance and adherence to the kennel ordinance are pretty accommodating. Um, and it's, it's really a short script for you have to meet the kennel ordinance requirements in the ordinance itself. So you know, I, I guess I was just saving a little space. Um. I guess maybe we're not, I'm not communicating well. Um, I, I understand uh, that's on page page eight here of the, of the, the narrative, um, those conditions, number one. And I was, I guess I was looking further on into the more itemized locations and, and um, just had more concerns about that and, um, and um, um, I said far from, from far from comfortable, um, but Mr. Nelson often comforts me, and so we'll see if he can uh, anything there. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just dovetailing into what uh, Bill was saying, um, you know, yes, it, it it certainly is nicer when the planning commission can be uh, much more thorough and, and get all of the and anticipate questions that would come up before the board of commissioners. Um, if, if they didn't do it uh, substantially enough to the satisfaction of the board of commissioners, there is always an option to send this back to the board or the planning commission to rehear or focus on certain questions or issues that you might have. But ultimately um, what this is, and this is what Bill was trying to say is that this is a request um, for the interim use permit. So it's, it's a request for the use and it doesn't alleviate the property owner's responsibility to adhere to all other aspects of every other ordinance that's in place. So we're just talking about the use of this property as uh, a kennel operation. And then all of the rest of the requirements, the wetlands, the land use, the septic, the wells, um, that all has to adhere to other requirements that are out there. A well is not required unless it is required. Um, and uh, once we hit or get further into the process, once uh, the use, overall use is either uh, accepted by the board or not, but if it's accepted by the board as an allowable use for the duration of the interim use permit, that's when more work starts happening in terms of getting the, um, the stormwater control, the wetlands, all of that stuff into place so that, um, so that everything gets to be in order at that point. And that's what the, the point of the uh, inspections are, uh, be that at the end of the year, and usually at the end of the year, and, and to answer Commissioner Hawkins' questions, um, the timing of that also allows for a time span to see if we've had any calls uh, into the office, complaints about this, or if there are at any kind of uh, issues with uh, stormwater or anything. We can compile those at the end of the year, giving it a significant amount of time. And as Bill indicated, that doesn't stop us from going out uh, in between you know, now and whenever the end of the year is to do any kind of evaluation if we feel there are concerns about stormwater noise or other uh, type of items. So I thought I would just throw that in there that this is just, it's, it's, a, it's an overall use uh, question. Is a kennel operation okay and compatible with this particular area for this particular time period that's in here? And then uh, once that's established, if it is, then the work gets in to adhere to the rest of the, um, of the requirements. And if the commissioners, again, feel that not enough uh, evaluation had been done at the planning commission, there is the option to send it back to the planning commission for further review with direction from the board uh, as to what they would like focused uh, on. It would be um, probably inadvisable to conduct kind of that public hearing aspect of it at the board of commissioner level. Um, you would just determine whether you had adequate information to make your decision or not. And if you did, you make your decision. If you don't, then you revert that back. And we've done that from time to time, but not, not very often. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And thank you, Mr. Lane. Any other uh, questions, comments from commissioners?
one here, or C, any. Um, so how, how I see it is um, we can uh, have a motion to approve, we can have a motion to deny, we can uh, have a motion to kick it back to planning um, for further uh, discussion on particular items um, if more details are needed. Mr. Mills, Chairman Mills. Mr. Saul. Yeah, I, I would say that with the controls that are put in place and the short uh, duration of this uh, for controls and what has been put in place, I would make a motion to approve the interim use permit for the dog kennel on County Road 14 in Junction. Mr. Saul, we have a motion. Is there support? I can support. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none. Oh, Commissioner Storley? No. No, no. Uh, hearing or seeing none, uh, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Nay. Commissioner Sullivan? Nay. And Commissioner Mills is nay as well. Um, the motion fails to pass uh, a two to three vote. Um, I don't know if this has happened under my uh, tenure as chair. Um, and so um, at this point, that motion is gone. Um, we cannot reintroduce that particular motion again in this meeting. Um, we can um, introduce another motion if, if the board so wishes. But we don't have to. And it appears that um, Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, I, I really hate to see this just die without more information. So I would like to suggest we send this back to the Planning Commission to get more detailed drawings and information about the wetland on this property, about where the structures are, where the actual um, lines are for distance from house to dog yard to the weight and how large the waste management area is. Commissioner Hawkins, um, and I'm sorry, was that a motion? Yes, sorry. Yes. <laughs> kind of was okay, wordy, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> so we have a motion. Is there support? Swallowson supports. Also, we have a motion and support. Any further discussion? Um, for my part, and please, other commissioners and staff disagree with me. It, it seems that there um, there are some changing um, uses and dynamics in the neighborhood. It also seems like um, there are potentially some revisions that need to be happening with uh, with ordinance in 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 regards to this issue, uh, kennel specifically, um, and um, and just a lot more information needed as as um, Commissioner Hawkins uh, moved. And um, one of the things that I would like more information on as well is, is uh, volume of waste. Um, what what kind of, I mean, that should be a measurable thing that will help determine setbacks um, and based on the number of dogs. I think that would be helpful to have uh, those kinds of uh, drawings or measurements as Commissioner Hawkins uh, maybe stated earlier. To um, as well, so um, that's my only other comment. I think. Uh, I actually, take that back. Uh, also, the the um, the dimensions of the the, the quote unquote yard or, or or kennel area. I think that's uh, 
relevant information as well that the Planning Commission should should be considering. Um, that would be another item that I would request. And Commissioner Salson, I saw that you unmuted and. Thank you, Chairman Mills. And and really, if there's if there's information from the planning group that if if it's thought that this space or this the dimensions or this type of thing that seem to be the, the real challenge um, here, if if the if that is a consideration and we say this isn't the right size of a lot or the dimensions don't aren't conducive to this type of thing. Um, at least a discussion and uh, from that group on if we need to be reviewing and changing the, you know, the stipulations for what size of a, of a property or dimensions of a property to try to help homeowners or people that are looking to start those types of operations in our county uh, to give them a little guidance. I just, I'm, I'm feeling, um, you know, that a property owner bought in an area where it, it, they look like they met the criteria and then be challenged. And so that is what it is. That isn't going to change right here today. But as we go forward, let's give some consideration to try to help uh, homeowners in the future, I guess, is what my my ask is from the, the Planning Commission, at least to give us as commissioners feedback on that. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Salson. And um, Commissioner Strolley and then Commissioner Sullivan. Um, thank you. <clears throat> yes, and I support all the above to, to get a better handle on what this means when um, a person is going to do a business such as this in a residential area to begin with and the size of land and, and all of the criteria of like, what are you going to operate it as? What is it going to be? That type of thing information and what Travis has just <clears throat> collected, if that could be sent to us, um, then we have a better chance of moving forward. Right now, we're kind of going on, well, this used to be a really big dog mushing area and it still is, and it's a business and I'm all for business. It's just the situation that um, this particular owner is in right now. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. And really my concluding comment here is one that I think reflects collectively what many of us have said, that we're looking at a residential neighborhood, we're looking at supporting businesses, I believe we all support mushing, but let's make sure that our ordinances are in alignment with good use for all different kinds of individuals who are living here in Cook County. So I would really support taking a look at these ordinances and uh, gathering a lot of information and taking a, a real serious look at, do we need to make changes? Sullivan, well, yeah, I think we're all, I think we're all in alignment there is, is the impression I'm getting. We're all trying to say uh, very similar things here. Um, and I, I, I concur as well. Um, any, any further discussion before we take it to a vote? Mr. Yorkie. So, Mr. Chairman, I understand there, there are two basic issues here. One is that this is, uh, the, the motion is to, to send this back to the Planning Commission for consideration of further specific questions that the board would like to have answered. And so to make sure that uh, there's a clear understanding of what the board is asking for, um, how would you all like to um, make that happen? Do you wanna forward uh, questions to uh, either Mr. Lane or Mr. Nelson so that those can be compiled and presented to the planning commission? Um, is there another mechanism for doing that? And then the second question is regarding the reconsideration or the updating of uh, policies regarding kennels or, or any other kinds of ordinances that pertain to this situation. What, what is your pleasure? Uh, yes, and my screen froze again. So um, anyone can speak up and interrupt me, but um, I, think, I think it would be um, productive to, to have us 
now um, maybe give a give a list, but um, but maybe it's um, more thorough and and um, better process to submit those those um, requests to uh, Mr. Lane and and the Planning Commission um, via email. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mills, we can't hear you. You lost your audio. My apologies. When when my video disconnects and then reconnects, it automatically mutes me. So that's convenient. Um, uh, what what I was saying was, uh, I think we can do that via email to Mr. Lane and the Planning Commission uh, as individual commissioners uh, if we want to go through and and have specific requests. Uh, of things to consider or further consideration, um, and then, then it would be a record of uh, on the planning commission when they when they go through that. Uh, we could do it now. Um, I'm I'm just thinking um, we can have better process and better thinking if if we do it um, as not now. <laughs> um, and as far as the ordinance is is um, concerned, um, that's of course a much bigger. Um, Discussion, and and I'm not sure what would be best process there to to have those uh, re to have that review. Um, do we have? Uh, well, looks like Mr. Nelson's on it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, the ordinance <clears throat> uh, review process is a bit more involved, and frankly, uh, the kennel. A uh, specific portion of the ordinance is, is is actually fairly recent in the in about ten years ago I think it was um, or maybe even more recent than that uh, we did have a formalized committee that went through and and met for a long period of time and took in uh, a bunch of uh, public comment from from those that uh, are in the mushing industry and those that are concerned about their uh, their community uh, and and the impacts, any potential adverse impacts of, of uh, the kennels in the area and came up with a, a full report. And that's what the current um, uh, ordinance provisions are based upon. So if we were gonna go ahead and change those uh, provisions, I think we would have to go through a similar type process. Um, and it may be, uh, we, we had recently also gone through a full comprehensive uh, land use plan uh, update as well. And um, we, we, we may wanna wait until we have to update our comprehensive land use plan, or if we don't wait for that um, portion, then we, we probably would have to uh, assemble another committee again and go through that whole, that whole other process since the, the changes that are, that are in place were based off of that. And, and, and if, if I could just jump in real quick, Mr. Chair, again, um, there are a lot of other provisions in the ordinances that we're trying to to tackle, you know, we're trying to chip chip away at and, and get uh, in terms of shoreland, vegetation management, um, other issues that we're trying to get in. The subdivision ordinance uh, also is in, in great need of, of uh, amending and updates. Um, so it, we, we can put it on the list. It's not a, a high priority because we just really haven't gotten a lot of kennel requests in any time, you know, in, in the <clears throat> recent past. So this is, is, I don't know if this is a one-off or what it is, but I'm, I'm not sure given the priority of other changes that need to be done, if this rises to that level of initiating a full uh, ordinance redo process uh, at this point. Understood, thank you, yeah. So from my perspective and my perspective alone, um, the, the reason why I thought a review is necessary is because of some of the um, potential conflicts that I can see uh, with with this request and, and just maybe it is just the specific geometries of, of the parcel. Um, also, um, Pointed out that that they're they're you know it makes it challenging, um, but but I I think that um, 
there have been significant changes in our community and in in that neighborhood and just our land use in the last 10 years heck in the last one year i would say um maybe not that neighborhood specifically but certainly our community and so um I, I recognize that there there have been recent uh, revisions and, and reviews, but um, but I think I'm afraid to say we're already needing it yet again. Um, so yeah, put it in the list, please. Um, and then if us as commissioners can can forward on our specific uh, inquiries to the planning commission regarding this request, um, I think that might be the most uh, productive way forward here. Does that sound? Please, Commissioner Sullivan. I, I would echo that as well. So we can send our list of questions and concerns to Mr. Lane um, to provide to the Planning Commission. And then um, I would be happy whenever it's appropriate and others are interested to begin to look at our ordinances and try to get involved and engaged in updating. And, it, and it's not just this particular ordinance. I think just we need to be on a rotation where we're consistently looking and evaluating our ordinances based on change. Mr. Yorkey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I request that the commissioners also copy Mr. Nelson and myself on those emails? Absolutely, thank you for, for clarifying that. Okay, well, I think that's the end of further discussion. We can do our uh, roll call vote, and this is to um, send it back to the Planning Commission for uh, review um, about specifics that we will be forwarding on to Mr. Lane and copied to Mr. Yorkey and Mr. Nelson. Commissioner Hawkins. Hi. Commissioner Smallson. Aye. Charlie. Aye. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Mills is aye as well. That is approved unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, uh, commissioners, for a good discussion. And thank you, Mr. Lane, for your um, work on this. And uh, Mr. Nelson and Mr. Yorkey for your work and guidance on this as well. That brings us down to item 9C, and that's a request for a conditional use permit to install an internally illuminated sign on property adjacent to Highway 61 and Grand Marais. Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioners, this is a uh, conditional use permit request from David Smith, who uh, is a, I believe, statewide insurance uh, agent representative his property is up uh, at the west end of Grand Marais before the Forest Service, uh, right next to the uh, the RV, the old gas station there. I'm sure you've seen it repeatedly. Um, he came to us uh, last summer, actually, uh, regarding a display um, and was informed by Land Services that uh, he had two options. One was to do it through a sign permit alone, which would have been an externally illuminated sign uh, or a conditional use permit, which invokes modern technology, LED displays and that sort of thing. And he opted to go forward with the internally illuminated conditional use permit uh, process. A um, Couple of discussions that were uh, enacted through land services included uh, conversations with MnDOT I'm sure you all know that Minda is very protective of their right of way, but also they're very, very much overseers of safety issues. And uh, the, the concern that they had was that the display not be too uh, bright or distractive to on oncoming traffic. Um, that was part of the discussion with the Planning Commission. And uh, also the Night Sky Initiative, which is kind of at the forefront of Cook County's nocturnal aesthetics now, a very important consideration. Uh, we, I discussed uh, with a couple of Night Sky representatives 
uh, about the implication of, of an unad unadulterated internal display. And from that, we uh, came up with the conditions, which I think are, are pretty, pretty uh, responsible in regards of not interfering with the night sky uh, aesthetic. So uh, the Planning Commission had uh, moderate discussions and concerns, but ultimately they approved unanimously uh, the request for the internal illuminated uh, display uh, with a couple of condition uh, modifications, including an overhang on the top to prevent uh, overhead or upward diffusion of light, but also either uh, shutting off the display at night or a reduction to 10% of the, the lumen capability of the display. Uh, and I think that's a, a fairly reasonable uh, uh, encroachment uh, as far as the regulatory process. I talked with uh, the mayor of Grand Marais and uh, their, the city council's approach was to not get involved because it was county jurisdiction, but certainly they have concerns about the, the brightness of the display. And hopefully this is another uh, permit with, with a review uh, qualification so we will be able to look at this display during different components of uh, visibility and illumination. And, and that's what the sign ordinance is about. It was a good process, good discussion, and a unanimous decision with the recommendation for the Board of Commissioners to approve the request as well. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns from commissioners? Um, I had a question, Mr. Lane. Um, uh, I certainly appreciate the, the sensitivity of, of the dark sky um, issue, and, and I think we'll be hearing more about that in the future. Um, and I hope that um, that we can we can look more into that as uh, as a county and and um, uh, committees. Um, but, uh, and so I greatly appreciate that overhead overhang and then, um, kind of some of the, the short research that I've done is just really, um, quantifying the number of lumens. And that's something I couldn't find in this request. And I think they brought that up in the discussion a little bit, but it, it wasn't, um, specifically known. And so... In my mind, without knowing that, 10% is 10% um, of what? You know, it's it's not defined. Um, it makes it really hard to to make this decision. Um, so I was hoping we could we could you know find that a little bit better. It, and, and Commissioner Mills, uh, Mr. Chair, um, that that's a valid point. And and I think if you looked at the narrative, this did come up. Uh, during the 2016 rush for internal illumination, a switch over from just regular fluorescence over to LEDs and stuff. And there is no proven repeatable process, uh, distance, uh, timing, duration, things like that, which would be part of a scientifically reproducible assessment. So yes, it's highly subjective. 10% is 10% of 6,000 lumens is a, still a pretty significant visibility. 10% of 50 lumens is not very bright at all. So uh, that's where that, that other component of turning it off during non-business hours is perhaps an alternative which is more reproducible and more uh, observable. Yeah, and I think that's a... Yes, yes, that is that is much more clear. I would say is having it off, um, and whether that's after business hours or if that's um, sunset or civil sunset or you know that could get a little um, less clear. But but business hours certainly could could be clear. So, um, and 
I did see a reaction from Mr. Smith when when the when it was after dark, um, but but there wasn't any further discussion on that. But anyways, I've, I'm rambling here. Uh, any commissioners? Did that bring up any any questions for anyone? Commissioner yeah, Adams. I um yeah, I also had concerns about the dark sky, and personally, not a fan of lighted signs, but saying during business hours yeah i he's an eight to four operation and it just kind of surprised me that you'd need a lighted sign during the day if he decides to stay open until eight o'clock at night is that what we say business hours i'm just wondering about all the different little things yes thank you commissioner hawkins i i'm i'm curious about all that as well um I'm not sure how to, uh, I mean, we can certainly define that, um, but I was hoping for, for more discussion about that um, as a discussion with, with Mr. Smith or any other uh, commissioner thoughts, comments, concerns? I don't I don't see any or hear any um, so I would I would entertain a motion um, ready for that Again, I think oh, uh, I think Mr. I think Mr. Mill or uh, Commissioner Mills at the uh, again this is striking me as where our ordinances and our where the community is moving appear to be in conflict again, and so I think that's where your resistance or at least my resistance I'll speak for myself <laughs> uh, is coming um, again. I I am always going to be an advocate for the property rights, and if you're following ordinances as written proponent of those things, you know, and, and back the property owner and the business owner in that response. But at the same time, again, as I stated, I get the sense from the group and the discussion that we have an ordinance that isn't keeping pace with the dark sky movement and, and the way that the community is getting behind that. Thank you, Commissioner Slauson. I, I, I missed the very end of what you said. Um, start. Last thing I, I, was like, I was likely repeating myself because I do that. Sometimes. Fair enough. I, I, I believe I understand your point and, and I would concur. Um, and I had a similar, con it was interesting to me, much like Commissioner Hawkins, about if this is only used during business hours, why do you need it lit? Um, and, and, you know, all this being said, an intern my understanding is an internally lit sign um, it is much better for the night sky than an externally lit sign. Um, and so, you know, this makes, a, this makes a lot of sense in my mind. If you're going to have a lit sign, that would be internally lit. But I guess there's variations there, and that lumen intensity and that ambiguity is what makes me uncomfortable. Um, Chairman Mills. Wait, Commissioner. Yes, please, Commissioner Storley. Well, when <clears throat> this is what I don't understand. <clears throat> if we um, say you have a conditional use for a sign, are we saying then that you only have a sign lit for a certain amount of time? Wouldn't that be up to the owner? <clears throat> I mean, does our um, conditional use, I don't see anything here that says um, that it'll only be on a certain time. Um, it would make more sense to be on at night for folks to see the sign in the daytime. They're going to see the sign because it's obviously there. You don't need any light to say, this is who I am. Stop in. So where do we go with the minutia of saying to a business, 
um, you you can have it only certain hours. That's what I'm not understanding. <clears throat> or are we not saying that? Uh, my my interpretation, and I see Mr. Nelson here again. He's probably going to save me, but I was going to say my interpretation uh, it, it, from from the Planning Commission discussion was that can be one of the stipulations that it can you can set that time period of the internally lit signs, um, whether that's uh, a certain hour, uh, business hours, or um, or uh, daylight hours or, or what have you. But Mr. Nelson, please save me. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> the, the Board of Commissioners does have the uh, ability to place conditions upon interim and conditional use. Uh, and what it's what it, the intentions of that are trying to strike that balance between uh, property, personal property rights or commercial property rights uh, to be able to utilize uh, the property and the sign, um, uh, but also uh, balancing that with kind of the protecting of the character of the locality, the night sky, kind of just trying to balance all those things to mitigate any of the adverse uh, impacts that might happen. And so, yes, it, it does make more sense to illuminate the sign at night, but then again, at the same time, then you're producing more light. Um, and, and we've gone as far uh, in, in some of our reviews, uh, more in the kind of the Clearview Lockport or even the Tofty Holiday, looking at the uh, amount of lumens that are lit and, and going through those studies and seeing how much is actually lit because it can also enter into the range of, of public or traffic safety. If you're going down the road and it's a foggy night and you have an internally lit sign, especially if it's, it's pulsing at all or if, if it's uh, bright, it can produce a certain amount of even vertigo or so uh, and, and cause some, some concern while driving. So that's why you have that ability to do that. Um, you know, you guys have to have to be able to exercise uh, judiciously in terms of creating that balance as to what you think would be uh, reasonable under the circumstances. One other question that I had too is about the color of the light. Um, in the little research I've done, there's been other communities that have ordinances the, and I'm not saying the color of the sign, right? Not the lettering, but the actual LEDs that are producing the light. Um, uh, 3,000 Kelvins, I think, is kind of that threshold for anything above that gets a little too cold, and, and so you want that, yeah, too cold, and so you want that warmer light um, for less of a intrusion. And so that's also a component that is not addressed, uh, I believe, specifically in in the discussion or, or the current ordinance. Um, so that might be something we want to consider or get more clarification on. Pros again, so someone is raising their hand up. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, I'm looking for a motion here. Um, we can we can have some we can define some parameters beyond what the planning commission uh, stated. Um, my thoughts again are uh, just uh, that hours of of lighting. Um, we could also talk about. Uh, instead, the uh, intensity, which we would need more information on, which would require, I believe, going back to the Planning Commission. Uh, and then also, uh, the color is something that I would request we consider. Um, and I don't know if other commissioners have any thoughts on that, if we're overstepping or if this is reasonable. Um, please chime in. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Storley. In regards to having a lit sign 24 seven, you look up and down highway 61, most businesses have a sign that's lit 24 um, seven. That's why they put the sign up. Um, I don't really feel that we, um, 
should indicate to the business owner when to have it on and when to have it off. You have a lit sign advertising your business. And when he shuts the door, when they shut the door at holiday or wherever, the sign is still on. So I, I guess I feel that um, a business owner should have the prerogative to advertise his business. Since I, since I since I got an opinion from you on that, I, what, what are your thoughts on the, the lumen side of things, which is the measure of the light intensity or the strength of the light? And and as long as I'm asking that, what are your thoughts on the color of the light? Mr. Chair, was this not discussed at the planning and zoning? the intensity and the color, whether it be a white light, a blue light or a yellow light, was that part of his request? It was not specifically addressed. Uh, there was very brief discussion and please Commissioner Sullivan, you were there so you, you could maybe respond better, but there was brief discussion about the intensity, but it was not clearly defined whatsoever. That is absolutely correct. There was no definition. So this was passed um, unanimously by the um, commission as it stood. Mm -hmm. Maybe are we getting a little bit too deep right now for this particular request? And in the future, we um, look into other requests and have a review or a, a look-see. I, <clears throat> I remember that we went through this, didn't we, Tim, a few years ago. <laughs> And, uh, and um, <clears throat> changes happen, things happen that we need to <clears throat> revisit, you know, what was done seven, eight years ago. So I think his request was he would like to have a lit sign. And as a business owner, he should decide what that means. And uh, I don't assume that it was passed, that it was going to be like a neon sign or light or anything but I would like to just stick to his request. He would like a lighted sign by his business. Yeah, so I guess that's why I was, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Mills. I was gonna say, um, that, that, that's why I was asking, I guess, is, is if we are in fact getting too deep into this, um, but those are the kinds of questions that came to my mind that were briefly discussed at the Planning Commission, were not resolved. And, and so, my, oops, my video died again. But so my thoughts were that um, when we see problems or, or we see, um, you're muted again, Commissioner. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, I'm getting I'm getting in the routine of getting dropped here, um, but when we see kind of these deficiencies in in or, or, or holes or whatever um, as things change in the ordinance, like I would I, I'm much more happy to address them than to um, wait till next time. And um, but that's why I was asking, and I do appreciate that feedback, Commissioner Starley, because. Um, because that's, that was my fear is that we're getting too deep in here, but I do want to address the questions that come to my mind as, as uh, I believe Commissioner Swallison um, was indicating that it seems to be um, some conflict between the ordinance and, and our community's um, wishes. Um, but we also need to respect the business and the property owner. At the... So I would recommend that we take a look at this again, Mr. Chair, um, the ordinance, um, but I would be happy um, to make a motion to request for the conditional use permit for an internally illuminated sign on the property up on Highway 61 that we've been discussing. But again, with the caveat that we look at that ordinance and try to get some more definition so that we are updated given our dark, dark skies designation and we're looking to our current needs. 
Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion. Is there support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. Um, any further discussion? Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, I just want to clarify, um, Commissioner Sullivan, your motion, does it include all six of the recommended um, uses here, uh, that, uh, what do you call it, the, the six conditions, sorry. It does include all those six recommended conditions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any further discussion, um, <clears throat> questions? One question I did have too, and, and Mr. Lane or, or Mr. Nelson can maybe help me understand this. Uh, when we get to these conditions, it says, uh, the following conditions may be applied. And I know that the difference between may and shall is significant. Um, could you help us understand that a little bit better? Okay, Mr. Chair, I'll just <clears throat> really quick. Um, when it comes out of the uh, out of the planning commission, the planning commission will have a, a, a list. Well, actually, the re, the narrative, the report goes to the planning commission. Um, Bill, when he prepares the narratives, uh, looks at all the information and kind of provides a suggested list of conditions that could possibly be attached to it. Goes in front of the planning commission. The planning commission. Uh, discusses it over. Sometimes they change and, and modify the conditions at that level. Uh, and then whatever comes out of the planning commission uh, to the board of commissioners is been, is been recommended by the planning commission uh, for you to adopt. So it's still, because the planning commission is a recommendation board, it still is a may. Uh, once it gets to the board of commissioners, once you adopt them, then there shall conditions. So you can you have the ability to adjust, modify, add in other conditions, change them around. Uh, since the planning commission is just a recommended body, and you guys are the decision making bodies, so you could do it. But once you make that decision, um, then the commit the conditions are shall. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none, um, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Charlie? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. And Commissioner Mills is a nay. Um, we have approval four to one. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And let's see, what's wrong screen. That ends our land services section of the agenda. Um, it is now uh, 1035. Um, I would yeah. ask if we could, or I'm sorry, 1135, thank you. <clears throat> Time warp. Um, I would ask if we could take another five minute break here, um, which would bring us up to 40.
have um, 11.40. I almost said 10.40 again, but it doesn't look like we quite have everyone here. So I'll, I'll Attorney Hicken, are you um, with us on the call? Commissioner Salson, are you with us? You are, yes. Attorney Hicken, are, are you back? Brady, you don't have anything that you need to uh, address on our agenda today by chance, do you? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I really, I really don't. That's, that's great, I was just, just checking. Um, attorney, I see Attorney Hicken now. Um, thanks anyways, so um, Mr. Powers. All right, uh, we're all back, and we can move on to item number 10, attorney. Uh, 10A is the attorney mini training on the bylaws overview. Take it away, attorney Hicken. Why, thank you. Uh, you appear frozen. Um, I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. I'm going to turn off my... <clears throat> I'm going to turn off my video and see if that helps. My screen is frozen. It says that you started uh, screen sharing, but I don't see anything being shared. On my end, it says I am screen sharing. Yeah, it says that here too, but I, I don't see anything besides those words. Attorney Hicken, would you like me to try to share my screen and you can tell me when to go to the next slide? Sure, but my entire computer is frozen right now. I'm glad that you can hear me, but I can't click on anything. Let's 
So I'm having connection okay. issues here at the courthouse. Okay. Well, we can hear you, and that would be wonderful, April, if you could share yours. There we are. Boom. We have the first page up. Can you see that, Attorney Hicken, or I yeah, guess that would make it difficult. Computer is back in action, apparently. So, um, you know, I know that you have had a long meeting. We're going to make this quick. Um, I just have 10 slides, and this is an overview of our bylaws and rules of operation that were passed uh, last year. I just um, I want to turn my video on again and just see how this works to show you that the um, county commissioner handbooks are now available. We just finished constructing these. This is a 2021 version and it includes <clears throat> a couple additional sections, including one on tribal sovereignty and treaties. It also includes a, print, a printed version of the rules of operation and bylaws. Some of you may have already printed those, but <clears throat> these are gonna be ready to pick up at the courthouse. So I'll put them down um, on Judy's table for this week. And you can contact me separately if you wanna pick them up a different way. Okay, so um, advance. There's not a whole lot of legal information in this uh, presentation, but to the extent there is, it's designed for you and not for any member of the public who's watching. Info only for them. Okay, um, so our operating rules and guidelines were finally enacted in October of last year um, under a four-member board at the time, including Commissioner Mills and Storley, along with Commissioners Bersheim and Dukirk, we spent at least six months uh, drafting these guidelines and rules. Um, and I, I like this paragraph, which appears in the introductory section. Um, these rules are intended to fac facilitate an efficient, fair, and well-reasoned process for fulfilling the board's responsibilities. Um, formalization and publication of these rules aid in transparency and clarify for staff and the public, the board's intentions and mode of operation. So this is not only an internal document, this document is um, designed for use by the public, um, those who wish to participate in board meetings and those who just wish to know exactly how the um, board makes its decisions. Every year, um, you have an opportunity to review and amend the rules um, uh, at the first meeting of February. Um, and that motion for action can be made by any member of the board. The Any member of the board can also um, ask to suspend the rules and that comes that can come at any meeting, not necessarily the first meeting of February. Um, if, a commissioner uh, is uh, asking for an amendment, that commissioner needs to provide the proposed amendments to other commissioners at least five days in advance so that they may review and consider the amendments. It's just a majority vote like any other vote to amend or suspend. So three out of five and the amendments become effective at the next meeting of the board. So you can't change your rules to apply at the same, for that change to apply at the same meeting. If you wanted to change your operation, you'd need to suspend the rules. Um, our, uh, we can set whatever rules of procedure we want or the commissioners want, um, but if there is a conflict with other higher forms of law like Minnesota statute or federal law, uh, those laws will supersede the rules of procedure. Um, of course, all of the board's authority comes from state statute and I've listed some of those statutes, set statute sections here. Um, and these are also listed in the first pages of the bylaws. We presume that when the legislature changes those statutes and mostly they come into a changes come into effect August 1st of the year, um, those changes are effective immediately. And so they modify kind of automatically our bylaws. Um, and then 
the goal would be to reflect the change changes in statute in the next draft. <clears throat> Section three, I'm just going to go through a few of the sections here. Um, section three, board organization. This is where you can find the um, how the board defines its membership, districts, terms, uh, vacancy, and compensation. Those items are really defined by reference to specific statutes. But if you're looking for what those statutes are, you will find them in section three. Um, and the voting for chair for officers, including chair and vice chair, is also in section three. I noted that I failed to uh, eliminate some of the language that the commissioners had asked to eliminate. Um, Chairman Mills and Commissioner Storley, I don't know if you remember this, but um, there was some suggested language when we were drafting that we do voting for officers by ballot. And it's my memory that the commissioners did not want that language. That's what my note says. That's gonna be one of the changes I'll recommend um, for the 2022 version of the bylaws. So be thinking about that. Um, all right, and then section four is meetings. Basically here's where you'll find the different descriptions of types of meetings and their purpose. Um, the how how public hearings proceed and we've already covered that in another mini training um, a little bit about how citizens can request to be included on the agenda and participate although there's another section later in the bylaws where that's more fleshed out um, it, it also notifies that if you're presenting for the board you'll need to bring copies for the public a little different in um when we're meeting remotely, but <clears throat> that is the request for in-person meetings. Um, this is also where you'll find the recording and broadcasting sections of the bylaws where we indicate that any regularly scheduled public meeting of the board should be recorded and broadcast. Um, and then other meetings that are not regularly scheduled um, the commissioners can determine by a majority vote that they should be filmed and, pro and uh, broadcast. We talk a little bit about the um, role of the presiding officer. It's assigned to the chair, um, to the vice chair in the absence of the chair. And if the vice chair and the chair are gone, then the remaining three commissioners decide who should be the uh, presiding officer, but it lists out some of the duties of the presiding officer in section four. Section five is the rules of procedure. So um, think Robert's rules type rules of procedure. Um, and this is from the introductory part of section five, the basic enduring principles of rights that kind of um, are the foundation for rules of procedure are that the majority rules. However, the minority is given an opportunity to be heard and um, each individual has the right to participate in the decision-making process. We're talking about the members of the board here having the right to participate in the decision-making process. Balanced against those principles are the canons of efficiency. So running an efficient meeting that doesn't last too long um, includes attending to just one matter at a time and then balancing the affirmative and negative factions to a pending matter. And how I interpret that is that um, you wanna give um, reasonable time to each side. Um, if, <clears throat> if the affirmative kind of vote for a motion has already spoken quite a bit and the negative side hasn't had their opportunity, then you give the negative side their opportunity. Um, here are the uh, more underlying principles of parliamentary procedure. So it's interesting that we have underlying principles in two different sections and maybe some at some point we'll wanna combine those or decide which are the most important. Um, but a lot of these are consistent are just what the statutes say, which is that you need a quorum to take action. Um, others are more 
along the lines of Robert's rules of order, more formal procedure for, um, for board discussion and action. Um, so one item, it's item number five, says discussion other than preliminary discussion is not in order unless there's a pending motion. And what I've noticed is more of the practice of this board is um, to allow plenty of discussion ahead of a motion. And um, of course the, um, the chair decides what is preliminary discussion, which is allowed and what is the kind of discussion that's outside of that definition and sh you know, should be saved until after the motion is entered. Um, but this is one that we might wanna consider rewording or somehow making consistent with our practice or making our practice more consistent with number five, up to you. Uh, more on rules of procedure. So um, there is discussion about how to make a motion um, and when it should be discussed. So for newer members who are not familiar with how a meeting um, pr proceeds can check out section five, talks about the types of motion and their order of precedence, um, the situations in which a motion is out of order. So if something seems not quite right and you think you should call something out of order, you can refer back to section five and see um, if, if any of these situations is applicable. And then we also talk about when remote participation can happen in section five with, um, with reference to the pandemic rules. Section seven talks about the county board agenda, uh, not just like describing what the agenda is and when consent agenda items are appropriate, but also talking about how the agenda is prepared and distributed, which falls on the county administrator and uh, his duties. Uh, talks about the distribution list and how members of the public can contact the county administrator and, and uh, get on the list so that they are emailed the link to the agenda whenever it's published. And then we also talk about uh, minutes preparation and how that is um, the responsibility of the county auditor or their designee. Section seven covers committees. Um, I'm sorry, section eight covers committees, including the types of committees and their roles and purpose. And also the applicant application process for becoming a committee member. Check out bullet point three. Committee members receive a per diem unless otherwise stated. Um, I don't remember a lot of discussion about this bullet point, but uh, I would be interested to hear if we're acting consistently with this. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, this chart is handy. This is something that Rena Rogers created that just kind of shows the hierarchy, not necessarily hierarchy, but the procedure for which ideas come to the board. Um, so from the various committees to the committee of the whole, where you can discuss whether it should become um, an agenda item for action, and then eventually to the regular meeting <clears throat> on your agenda. <clears throat> Section 10 is called citizens, and it is about how members of the public can participate in the decision-making process. Um, this broad statement at the top kind of is the foundation for um, the rules about citizen participation, which is that the board supports the general public in following along in board business during their meetings. So all of our procedures should be consistent with that intention. Um, talks about audience participation at board meetings during public comment. Um, uh, and these are just a few of the things that are included in the list. Use the microphone, identify yourself. Uh, the chair will determine the time allowed for each speaker, which should be equal. Um, matters are discussed, are confined to county business. And then there are some decorum related rules that had a lot of discussion during drafting, including no demonstrations. Now a demonstration would be like the crowd booing or applauding others. Technically that is uh, not allowed under the guidelines for public comment. Um, 
and then people should refrain from insults, personal attacks, and other disruptive conduct. It is the chair's responsibility to enforce these guidelines, and I've seen lots of different styles of how to do that, um, many very effective. Um, and then we talk a little bit about communication to the citizenry, uh, to the public that comes from the from county officials. Uh, commissioners are encouraged to reach out individually to citizens to answer their questions or address their concerns. And then it talks about how the county engages in outreach through information briefs, the media and um, public hearings. Also included in the bylaws are uh, these two sections, the code of ethics, which we are going to talk about at our final um, county attorney mini training and uh, the county staff. So this just describes who else is at the table, including myself and the auditor and the county administrator. Here are some resources for you. Um, if you want to find out more or more detailed information also, um, you know, LMC and AMC have model, have some rules of order, much abbreviated, um, but they might give you ideas if you're looking to change our rules in some way and you're, and, um, and you want something to look at to refer to, you can go to these publications. Does anyone have any questions? Well, wasn't that thrilling? There you go. There's your overview. Um, these rules are available on the county website to any member of the public and of course to yourselves. And um, please be thinking about what changes you think should be made to the rules or discussed um, come February, 2022. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Attorney Hicken. And, and you know, I just wanna thank you again for your um, hard work on helping create these bylaws because um, before last year, we did not have a written common set of, of guidelines and bylaws. And that <clears throat> is problematic because um, it, it really gives a good framework for how we as commissioners should be operating with each other and with the public. And so I just think it's so important that we have those and yes, there will be um, modifications necessary, and 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 I think it's very important to review them. So thank you very much for for this um, brief overview, and and I hope that we can all um, take time and and go through them as thoroughly as as we can um, to look for ways to improve our our bylaws and our process. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Any, oh, commissioner, yes, Commissioner Sullivan. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to also thank you um, for the hard work you've done and not only putting the bylaws together, but I'll reiterate what Chairman Mills said, it, the attention to reviewing them annually. I think uh, so many times it's easy for us to develop some bylaws or ordinances um, or policies, and we forget that the important aspect is not only the development, but the continued attention to their review so that they are up to date and current. So thank you very much for that. Absolutely. All right. Well, that moves us on down to item 10B, filming location agreement, uh, the airport. Attorney Hicken. You are on mute. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so this draft agreement comes from another request by uh, the filming company called 13th Degree to film on county property. Um, it seems like they're there was a little uh, confusion about, you know, whether the airport commission had that authority or the airport administrator. And we asked that uh, it be put in front of the board and that the board come up with an agreement. I think there were, I actually was contacted by two different commissioners who were wondering if we were gonna have an agreement in place. Um, but um, this came about very quickly and they actually would like to start filming today. I asked them to wait until the board 
um, authorized that. So um, it's very similar to the agreement that you saw for filming at the jail, except a lot of the other, a lot of the complications related to uh, filming at a jail are removed here. It sounds like it's gonna be a low risk operation. Um, Rodney Roy is very involved and feels very comfortable that this will not um, impede on airport operation or kind of the official business of the airport. Um, if there is a conflict between the filming and um, operation of the airport, the operation of the airport has priority use. And do we have any questions or comments from commissioners? And um, without hearing or seeing any, I would entertain a motion. So Commissioner Sullivan. I move to approve the contract uh, relative to the um, seaplane base at the airport and the filming there. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, approved unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioners and Attorney Higgin. Uh, that brings us down to item 11, the auditor. Uh, however, there are no items under that, so I'll move on to item 12, administrator. Uh, item A is the update on the courthouse reopening. Uh, Administrator Yorkey. Good afternoon, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. And I'm going to make this as brief as I can, um, but there are a couple of important things that I want you to be aware of. Um, first of all, um, as Grace mentioned many, many hours ago in the first part of this meeting, um, the CDC guidance on masking has changed. Um, and the current, uh, the current recommendation is that folks who have been fully vaccinated uh, no longer have to wear masks. And so, um, and the governor, as Grace also mentioned, uh, quickly followed suit to say that is now the, the guidance from the state level as well. So that being the case, um, we are moving to reopen the courthouse to walk in traffic effective June 1st. Um, our, <clears throat> our recommendation to people coming into the building is that, uh, again, consistent with CDC guidelines, if you are fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Um, if you are unvaccinated, we strongly encourage people coming into our buildings to, to wear a mask. Um, we will continue following social distancing guidelines as well as um, hand washing and sanitizing recommendations because um, th those are effective means of, of preventing the spread of not only COVID-19 but other, other communicable diseases. And so um, that, that is our plan right now. Now in terms of the implications for um, our operations and the uh, opportunities for the public to participate in meetings of the Board of Commissioners. Um, because the building will be open on June 1st, that means that people could conceivably be coming to the boardroom to, uh, to listen to Board of Commissioner meetings. So we'll be enabling that um, through, through the end of June, we are still allowed under the emergency order to use video conferencing to, uh, to conduct meetings. Um, and so that's, that's what we'll be using in the uh, commissioner's room, as we did in the first part of the pandemic when we had staff uh, in the commissioner's room for, for board meetings, uh, so that if there are members of the public, they can participate or, or listen and, and see you all uh, via video conference. Now, moving into July, we anticipate that likely we will, at, at this point, if nothing else changes, we will need to resume having in-person meetings. And so that means the first business meeting of June, or I'm sorry, of July, we would be meeting in the commissioner's room, um, just as we used to do. Not we, because I wasn't here then, but you know what I mean. Um, anyway, so re reverting to the traditional way of having public meetings. And, um, you know, I, I think we'll probably, we'll set up the room in a fashion to 
um, make it possible for members of the public who want to attend to socially distance because again, um, the virus is still out there. We've made great progress in vaccinating uh, county residents, but there are still folks who are unvaccinated and there's still a certain level of risk involved. So um, we wanna keep folks healthy. And so when we do re resume in-person meetings, we anticipate having tables and chairs spaced out so that people can distance as much as possible. So I'll pause there. Any, any questions about that? Any concerns? I, I will say, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Maybe you were going to answer my question. I'll let you. I'll let you go. Um, no, I was just going to observe that um, I'm seeing a lot more uh, employees in the building uh, in recent weeks than I have previously. So uh, clearly, things are are opening up. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask uh, the commissioners um, if they had any specific concerns or requests um, for you or or for us. Um, when we do start uh, in-person meetings um, re regarding um, masking or, or um, barriers or, or what have you. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Farley. Yes, I have concern about wearing a mask for five hours as mm -hmm. distancing and um, the possibility that uh, would there still be an opportunity to be on a conference call or still part of the meeting without being there? That's a very good question. And uh, yes, Mr. Yorkie. Um, thanks for the question, Commissioner Storley. So currently state statute allows for remote participation by commissioners via telephone. Um, video conferencing is not currently part of that provision. However, there is pending legis legislation that would enable video conferencing to, to be used uh, in place of, of conference calling on the telephone. So um, there would potentially be a provision to, to enable that even after July 1st. Yeah, and that's that's exactly the what I'm looking for, Commissioner Starley. So thank you for that for that question and, and concern. And um, I would like to point out that I'm currently on a telephone, even though I'm in our teleconference or our video conference or whatever. So clearly, there's a need to address this uh, ambiguity um, by the state and, and what's what's allowed. Um, so I'm excited to hear whatever progress they they make there. But. Other questions or concerns um, about in-person meetings? Commissioner Hawkins. I don't have any concerns. Um, I trust the vaccine. I think the efficacy of the, that's been reported shows that those of us who have been vaccinated have very little risk. Um, I am open to attending in-person meetings without masking. Commissioner Hawkins. All right, Commissioner Salson. Yeah, I, I concur with uh, Commissioner Hawkins. Um, clearly, if uh, you know those of us that are at the meeting, particularly those that are up, uh, you know, in front of the room there, uh, if if all are vaccinated and you know, I don't have an issue. I don't to wear a mask during that time. I would also state, however, that if somebody does have a concern with that and would prefer that you know, masks be worn, I am completely open to that. I want people to be comfortable to come to the meetings and fully participate. Uh, that's really what's important to me, that, that we're able to continue to do business. The, the citizens feel comfortable coming to the meetings don't feel that there's a risk to themselves. Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Yorkey. Uh, th thanks for those comments. And uh, Commissioner Swalvelson, you, you said, you know, if somebody is fully vaccinated, and that is, of course, the, the big factor in, in all of this. 
Um, and it's important to note that we cannot ask people if they are vaccinated. And for that reason, I think it's really important. I, I went to Duluth this weekend to do some shopping. Um, I'm fully vaccinated and I wore my mask the whole time that I, that I was in and out of stores just because I feel like I, I know there are a lot of folks in the community who may not be able to get vaccinated for, for various health reasons. Um, who, who probably want to get vaccinated, and there are others who may have chosen not to be vaccinated. And, and just for the comfort of those around me and to, out of an abundance of caution, I've just taken that step personally. Um, but we can't, you know, we can't ask people about their status. And, and we don't know, I think it's really important moving forward, we don't know the, the unique situation of each person we encounter. And so it's, I think, important to, to you know, be understanding and to uh, make sure that we're taking others into account, being respectful of folks around us. And, you know, uh, our advice to staff will be that if they are serving members of the public who approach a service window wearing a mask, we want our staff to mask too, because that person may not be vaccinated. Um, and just out of, out of an abundance of caution and making sure that people are comfortable when they're doing business here in county buildings, that, uh, that we make them feel at ease. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too, similarly to Administrator Yorkie, have been vaccinated and wear my mask all the time when I'm out in public. And, you know, people are running into you out on the street, whether they're local residents or tourists who may come to our area and they don't know if we're vaccinated. And so I've just uh, continued to wear my mask so that I am, um, you know, in their eyes protecting them and also so that it is good modeling for others. Um, so I will continue to wear my mask. Um, yeah, and where, where I'm sitting with things is, um, um, I, I am fully vaccinated. My, my children are not yet um, able to be vaccinated and um, one will be, shortly here. Uh, the other will not probably until fall, it sounds like. Um, so I understand that the transmission through a vaccinated person is is low uh, risk, um, but I'm still trying to um, be as cautious as, as I can and, and also uh, set a good, good example for, for the youth and, and my kids typically. So um, it's a, a little strange and tricky to navigate as the whole past year has been, um, but I just want to make sure that we as a board are comfortable working with each other and comfortable expressing discomfort uh, or hesitations or whatever. And so just as long as we're communicating, I trust that that we'll be able to work through any any hurdles that there might be. So. Um, I think at, at this point, I, I would probably s still wear a mask um, in the courthouse um, just to try to, uh, and, and for our meetings, just to try to, um, to keep as many people comfortable and safe as possible. Um, I understand if, if that's problematic um, for others um, and, and respect that um, other people might have a, a different approach. So. Um, that's just where, where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you all for, for discussing. All right, shall we move on to the next item? Please. Thank you. Okay, so um, just a very brief update on the American Rescue Plan um, Act budget planning. We are um, reaching out to community partners to um, develop a, a budget. We, just as a reminder, the county uh, is receiving uh, about a million and sixty thousand uh, dollars, which is being paid out in two installments. And so we've received the first installment of roughly five hundred and thirty dollars, five hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars, and we'll be receiving the second installment uh, sometime be before March eleventh of next year. Um, <clears throat> again, funding can be used for a variety of, of public health reasons uh, related to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, and we expect that we'll be spending uh, a good portion of the dollars on that. Um, there's also a provision for the use of that funding for the expansion of broadband. Um, I have been talking with John Twist over at the Arrowhead 
Electric Co-op about uh, their needs and their desires. Um, they're in competition for about 17 or $18 million in funding that would enable them to uh, build out their system and provide fiber uh, to curbside for the remaining households in the county that don't currently have that access. So, um, and not clear what their needs will be. But the other, the other really big opportunity for us as a community is uh, this funding can also be used for infrastructure. And so that, that means um, we could be using it to expand um, water and sewer lines into platted areas that don't currently have uh, that infrastructure. Um, and so in terms of the county's uh, housing shortage right now, um, I mean, we've talked about that. I think it comes up at almost every meeting that I'm in. Um, it's the most acute need that we have currently. And so these dollars represent a good opportunity to, to maybe make some progress on that. And that's, that's what I'm keeping uh, in the front of my mind as I, as I think about how we um, could be spending these dollars. Now, of course, um, the plan we come up with for, for spending the, the uh, funds will need to be a community effort. And so we are talking to a lot of partners and I don't see this as solely the county's decision to make just as the solution to, to the pandemic and the plans we put together to keep our community safe were not driven solely by the county. It was really through collaboration with a lot of partners. And I feel like that's the best way to solve problems. So that's, that's the approach I'm taking in, in talking with people and figuring out the best way to use the uh, ARP dollars. And so there will be a lot more information uh, about that coming down the pike in, in coming weeks as we reach out to more folks. Um, and so that's, that's what I have for right now. Um, so just a few more things, if there are no questions about that. I did get an email yesterday from Jim Boyd at the chamber, um, and he and I um, had a, a few subsequent exchanges. The chamber is, is starting to plan its uh, annual gala that takes place in October. And as part of that, um, Senator Bach and Representative Eklund um, are going to be in town. And I think, uh, according to Mr. Boyd, um, it's been our practice that um, they come up here, they uh, participate in a board meeting. Um, frequently, this has happened on a Tuesday to coincide with, with this um, meeting. Um, but there's also the opportunity potentially to do it like on a Saturday um, where there would still be a meeting um, with, with uh, the Senator and representative and the board. Um, but another component of the visit is they have toured various projects. <laughs> that the county has undertaken, excuse me, with, uh, with state funding. And so I just wanted to um, ask the commission, um, do you have a preference for um, scheduling a visit uh, like that on a Tuesday, uh, which would be October 26th, or the alternative would be Saturday, October 30th? Um, from the chamber's perspective, I, I don't think they have a strong preference, but the benefit of doing it on a Saturday is it might provide for more time um, for, for us to spend, spend time with, the, uh, with Senator Bach and Representative Eklund. Um, and if there is going to be a tour, and I don't know how that would look, I'm not sure what projects might be the subject uh, of that kind of site visit, but um, if there's an interest in doing that, um, it feels like Saturday might be a better opportunity for that. Um, could be could be nice to show off what's been done, but I would much rather show what we hope to do, um, which is still you know need maybe would would probably be more advantageous on on a Saturday. Um, and traditionally, the Tuesday visits during the board meeting are pretty short and sweet. Um, so uh, any opportunity that we have to spend more time, I think, is a real advantage. Commissioner, thoughts? I certainly would support um, a Saturday so we would have an extended period of time to visit with our Senator and our representative. What's 
a ways a ways out there, but if we can both our calendars, both of those days are are open for me. Mm -hmm. So I think it I'm is during pheasant hunting season, but I'm happy to um, postpone my trip out west. <laughs> so I saw three nodding heads in support of it at Saturday scheduling and uh, Commissioners Storley and Paulson, are you good with that idea? My calendar Saturday looks kind of like all the rest of the days. Of the week, so Saturday's fine with me. Okay. Is that also the, the day of the uh, gala? <clears throat> it, well, it would be. That's what, that's what we're trying to plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So I'm hearing consensus for scheduling this on a Saturday, October 30th. So I'll I'll get back with with Jim Boyd and let him know that that's the uh, the board's desire, and uh, we'll go from there. And I'll have more information as we move forward on scheduling. <clears throat> All right, but just a couple more. I'm sorry, did somebody have a comment? Okay. Um, just a couple more items briefly. Um, I'm continuing to work on the uh, the tax abatement and TIF policy. Um, we we had the presentation um, at the Committee of the Whole in April, um, and you considered the uh, the draft policy at the Committee of the Whole this month. Um, I'm getting additional feedback from the EDA, and also have um, shared the the draft with some folks in the development community to get their feedback, because I think it's important um, to, to hear that perspective. Um, not, not that we would necessarily um, allow them to write the policy, but I think having their perspective is really important to, to coming up with a product that really serves the needs of the community. So um, I'll be bringing forward a revised draft of that policy at a future meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. My seasonal allergies are in full swing, by the way. So um, that's why I sound like a bullfrog today. Um, the last thing that I wanted to make you aware of is um, I had a meeting with the uh, city administrator, Grand Marais City Administrator Mike Roth, um, last week uh, in regard to the law enforcement service agreement that we have with the city. Um, and this is an agreement that has been in place with, without any revisions for over 20 years. Um, which means the, the cost of our providing that service, <coughs> excuse me, has not gone up in that, that time period. And so um, a couple of issues, I basically wanted to talk with Administrator Roth to just make sure that the, the scope of services still reflects what the city needs. Um, and we did talk about some ways to tweak that. He, he said that generally the scope is fine. The, the, um, services that they need from the sheriff's office really haven't changed that much. Um, in some areas, there may be a, a need for greater focus, for example, with, uh, with ordinance enforcement, but um, nothing substantive that, that will really change the look of that agreement. And in terms of uh, updating the, the um, amount of the agreement, that's something that we're going to approach carefully because you know we're in the same boat that the city is, which is that we don't have a lot of cash lying around, and so it's not like we can, um, you know, suddenly double the the cost of this contract because the city would not be able to absorb that. Um, and the other factor that we need to consider too is that this is not the only agreement that we have in partnership with the city. There's also a, a, a road maintenance agreement. Um, where we split duties of, of plowing and maintaining streets uh, in Grand Marais. And then there's also um, the, the uh, agreement regarding the YW, uh, YMCA, I'm sorry, which, which the city and uh, county are both parties to. So there, there are a number of other considerations and those, those are factoring into the discussion that we're having about the law enforcement agreement. Um, but where we are right now with, with the law enforcement agreement is that I'm gonna take the information that Mike provided and uh, make some updates to it, uh, make sure that attorney Hickam has a chance to, to review those and then share that with the city. And um, once we have something that looks agreeable to both sides, we'll be bringing it um, before our respective governing bodies for, for approval. And mercifully, that's all I have right now.
Okay. Uh, any questions about any items there? One other partnership I'd point out is is the library. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that needs any revisions, but just keep that in mind for when we're doing that whole comprehensive look at things. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you for those updates and with our partners. All right, well that uh, wraps up item 12 under administrator. That brings us down to item 13, employee concerns, commissioner concerns. As commissioner reports, uh, meeting updates. Uh, commissioner Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an update regarding um, what we refer to as the Passion Pit Committee. And uh, last night we met for a couple of hours and reviewed the survey results uh, for the property owners along Old Shore Road, as well as all of the remarks and comments that were turned in following our press release that Nick Kusick uh, had released. And it was evident from uh, the information we reviewed that providing a waste receptacle, a pet waste bag dispenser, and completing a survey marking the corners and boundaries of the property were strongly supported. Um, we also talked about the need for a no turnaround or no outlet sign being um, put up along the cart path uh, that provides um, a method to get in and out of four properties on the east side of the Passion Pit area. And lastly, in the area of signage, the group agreed to one sign on county property that would state the following, um, miigwech for respecting our neighbors, land, and water. And um, we talked a lot about other signage as well um, and responsibilities of the city and the county and how to do things. Um, but at the end of the meeting, we talked about whether this particular parcel should be public or private. And we agreed as a group unanimously that it should be maintained for public use. And at the end of the meeting, the group agreed that they would want to write a recommendation to our county board supporting the disposition of the MnDOT property to Grand Portage. And in addition to that, um, letters of support um, for that disposition to Grand Portage uh, will be coming from the Cook County Historical Society and potentially the city of Grand Marais and the Minnesota DNR. So I did want to update you on those key pieces to our meeting and um, inform you of that. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. That's, that's great to hear. Um, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, just to update the board, uh, Commissioner uh, Hawkins and I attended an in-person meeting, our first with the Arrowhead Regional Corrections Group. Uh, at the Northeast Regional Corrections Facility. In keeping with the Department of Corrections, all, mat, all personnel that were there at the meeting in person were wearing masks throughout the meeting internal to the, uh, to the facility. Uh, following that meeting, Commissioner Hawkins and I were granted a tour of the facility, both internal throughout and then uh, the extensive grounds uh, around that facility and uh, we're, we're granted access to look at all of the, the programming and things that they do at the Northeast Regional Corrections, which I will add are quite extensive. I, I give you that to let you know that the facilities are in very good shape. The programming is very robust and their statistics show that they're being very effective. But uh, also to let you know, people are gonna start requesting in-person meetings now so just to look forward to that and determine for yourself how you'll how you'll deal with that. Thank you, Commissioner Salson. It as well. Happy to hear. Happy to hear um, that it went well and and was so extensive. Any other uh, commissioner updates? Yes, Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, I just want to report from the Highway Advisory Committee. committee. Um, 
we've had a member offer his resignation. I don't know if it's made it officially to the administrator yet, but it's emailed me. And so there will be an opening in for district two on that committee, which um, is a really fun committee. <laughs> um, and right now we are um, looking at policies and ordinances that haven't been looked at for a while and make sure that they really are consistent with what our expectations are. So looks like I'm having fun doing it. Learning lots. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. That's that's great to hear and very relevant, right? Um, and uh, just as a brief update from myself, I was able to jump on the end of an AMC Futures Past Presenters Coffee, which Commissioner Storley had had recommended um, attending in the past. And, and I've gone to, I think this is my third one so far, and I would also recommend attending if, if you can. Um, that maybe there's only one more coming up, but I'm not sure. Um, and maybe they'll schedule more because it, <clears throat> it is very informative. But anyways, this is from state demographer Susan Brower and uh, a lot of discussion about the census. And um, we don't have those numbers yet, um, but we do know that Minnesota as a whole had the greatest response rate for all the states in the country. Um, and I believe by, by quite a lot. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, of course, Cook County has a lot of um, second homes, and they are counted as unreported households unless someone who owns that reports that it is indeed their second home. So there's there's lots of room there <clears throat> for us to look underreported. But I really want to applaud uh, um, interim uh, administrator Rena Rogers uh, for the efforts that she put into that while she was in that position, um, because all of the counts count and uh, and makes an impact on that. Um, one <clears throat> area of concern that uh, Susan Brower brought up, um, oh, and I, I'm going to forget the, the term now. It had to do with the, um, the anonymity of the data. And um, and that is um, leading to some in inaccuracies, um, and that's coming from the federal level um, down to the states. And so there's, I think you can expect more uh, discussion about that. And AMC is, of course, um, very uh, tuned into that, and and you'll you'll probably get communications about that. Um, but just. <clears throat> it, it's really important that we have as accurate of a count as possible. And so anytime there's shifting of numbers that can lead to problems. And, and so that's really where, where um, Ms. Brower is coming from and just wanted to bring that to our attention. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yorkie. Um, you, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, Rena Rogers' involvement in the census, and I just wanted to note there was a story in the Star Tribune um, a few weeks ago um, about how narrowly Minnesota held on to its uh, seat in Congress. Uh, the margin was 26 votes. If we had counted 26 fewer people, we would have lost that seat. Um, and so I was telling Rena, you know, conceivably your involvement in getting heads counted uh, in Cook County may have made the difference between keeping that seat and losing it. So pretty big deal. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, it comes down to that and, and um, really, really pleased that we were able to, to hang on to that. And <clears throat> I forget the Jack Swanson from Roseau County um, had made the reference that every head counted results in thirty thousand dollars of funding. Um, so he he tried to communicate that to um, you know, the people in in, in his district uh, and area when he was promoting the census and how important it really is for funding levels and our representation. Absolutely. So um, put a dollar amount, put a vote on it. It's it's very important and and very powerful. So 
um, it's funny now because uh, it's going to be another 10 years, right, before the next census. And, and so I had asked the question, is there any talk about real-time census data? I mean, I know private industries um, are tracking us and every every purchase we make, every whatever subscription we have, um, and if there's any room for um, collaboration there just to have better, more accurate, and of course, this goes up to the federal level and becomes very messy very quickly, um, and privacy is important as well. So just... Uh, so the, the answer to my question was no, more or less. <clears throat> uh, any other updates? Hearing or seeing none, um, I want to meetings to note here. We have our Community Leadership Committee, June 10th, 530. That's Zoom. Link is, uh, and phone number is in our packet. Board of Appeals and Equalization, June 17th at 6 p.m. Again, Zoom, the phone numbers and the link is in the packet. And then uh, brings it down to item 14, correspondence and memos. We have the Historical Society Board packet and uh, the lodging tax comparison, which is very interesting and revealing to see um, how uh, many visitors we have and, and what the state of affairs is. And it's a, it's a good indicator for our, our economic uh, activity in, in the um, And um, recognition of staff and anniversaries, we'll take care of that at other meetings. And that down to item 16, uh, which is adjournment. If there are no other items, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Commissioner Stryler, we have a motion. Is there a second? Hawkins, support. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Motion and support. Any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Walson? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We are adjourned.